this feels out of place. Let me just show you that. Just trying to line things up a bit better. Hello, everyone who's here watching me line things up. Uh, that's nearly out the shot. Move the camera. No, now my bookcase is disappearing. Oh, well, that's not too distracting. I won't look at it or draw attention to it. Hopefully my phone won't ring. It's upside down. Thank you, everyone, who's uh, jumped in and joining me. I'm cutting the top of my head off. I've moved everything around because I was, uh, well, not everything, but yeah, I've moved all this back when I was doing something earlier. You like the shirt. It's, um, well, you can easily guess what it is from the top line. It's got the Star Trek logo at one end, the uh, score gives it away. It's got the Enterprise, Enterprise D, not the Enterprise A, B, or C. So, hello everyone who's jumping in. I uh, will start off slow, give people time to arrive, for those who do arrive. One trouble with doing this here, those of you who've seen me stream before will know this, um, I could do with changing the order of my books on that bookshelf. They're in the correct order, but if I'm streaming, um, where the thumbs up are, oh, and that bookshelf, where the thumbs up are and where the number of viewers count is, is there. And I can't see it because I've got light books there. I need something dark in that corner so that I can see what's, uh, how many people I've got here and how many thumbs up. Luckily, it doesn't show thumbs down. I have a coffee. I have a water. And a squeaky chair. So everything I need to be live. You see five people, I see dead people. Different reference. Um, yeah, I've got Sherlock. He won't stay there forever, I'm sure. That was a bargain. The cup has... Some Star trek -y references on it as well. I'm not all about Star Trek. I was just checking my socks to see if they were Star Trek, but they're not. They're um, roller skating and skateboarding dinosaurs. Yeah, my trouble is if something squeaks like the chair, um, you feel sleepy, you may nod off to the sound of my voice. Um, if something squeaks like the chair, well, actually, it doesn't squeak so much me moving it that way, but the slide back squeaks more. So that always tempts me to keep moving my chair one way just so that I can squeak it the other way. Um, but yeah, I have the occasional star, the, the odd sort of Star Trek bit lying around, but not uh, not huge amounts. I just like the Star Trek universe. Star Trek makes me feel good. But yeah, so I've got uh, skateboarding and roller skating dinosaurs on my feet rather than Star Trek things. But yeah, that Sherlock was a bit of a bargain. Um, it was 99p, reduced from like 14.99 or something.
Recent purchases from the vintage market? What recent purchases? What vintage market? What have I done? What do I, what am I supposed to remember? Ah, in town. Oh, that's not very interesting. That was just a signed book and a signed picture. Echo, echo, echo. Yeah, that was a signed book and a signed picture. A signed book by uh, two comedians. Uh, they weren't there. The book was bought, signed, obviously, from a vintage market thing. I think we went to a vintage market with clothes and vintage tat, and Abby didn't walk away buying anything, I don't think, and I think I walked away with uh, spending £100. Show and tell. Got to watch what you ask for. It doesn't take too much convincing to go and do a show and tell. Live long and prosper. I've got some spocks. Um, I haven't disappeared. I've got Spock there. Sliding Spock back into place. Spock's home. And obviously Picard drinking tea. Wearing his microphone hat. Yes, I'm too easily distracted. Thank you for the congratulations. Hope your parents are well. I've got one of uh, Leonard Nimoy's uh, signed autobiographies somewhere as well. I think only one. I don't think I've got more than that off the top of my head. I'm sure if Abby and myself ever move, I'll suddenly think, oh, yeah, I totally forgot that I've got that book. And I, I have a lot of stuff. Which is why I always look like I'm sitting in a broom cupboard or a book cupboard. Yeah, I like the cup too. The only downside to the cup is it doesn't quite fit enough liquid in. So I have to drink really slowly to make it seem like there's more drink. Yeah, book cupboard is nice. Uh, Abby often comments on her concerns that this room might end up downstairs one day with the amount of books that are in here. When we move, um, that's one of the biggest difficulties is that um, I fill boxes with books. Normally, the boxes are big boxes with lots of heavy books, and then you just can't move the boxes. But yeah, it'd be nice to have a proper book collection one day, though. I always envy people who have proper, like, loads and loads of books. So, yeah, this is um, obviously a live stream. I haven't done a – I have been – I have live streamed. I'm trying to think when. some point recently. Was it the Mind Changers channel? Was it this channel? I can't remember. It might have been the Patreon one. But there's um, – yeah, it feels like I haven't live streamed properly for quite a while. Obviously, the idea of this one is to uh, celebrate two years as a sleep story channel. It would be nice 
to have my own library room with a fireplace, preferably making sure there's no way that the fire can spit accidentally in any direction of books, and that probably a fake fireplace, just for, to be doubly sure. It can look like a fire, but it's fake. So I don't end up accidentally um, setting fire to anything or having a chimney set on fire uh, or anything that could put the bus books at risk. But yeah, so it was the 10th of September. Uh, there should have been a post went live earlier on uh, my YouTube channel. I can't remember if it did or not. I assume it did. Um, sharing my first post um, since being a light. So my first story when I became a sleep stories channel. Um, so what happened, some of you've been around for years and years and years and years. You've been around long enough to see before I was gray. Um, just put that on the floor. Um, others of you are a little newer and younger to the channel. Yep, um, I kind of just do my own thing now. Um, it seems to go in one ear and out the other. Um, yeah, books must be protected. So, in the olden days, when I was very young, uh, I used to randomly make videos. Um, or not randomly, they weren't random. I used to make videos with intent. Um, I think I've told this before in one of the comments on the Mind Changers channel about how I used to record. Uh, so I would have, um, uh, back in the 1990s, my best friend would come and visit. And ever since I was able to buy a camcorder, I've had a camcorder. Um, and I've still got, obviously, some of the cassettes. Uh, I found one of my older camcorders fairly recently. Uh, I've always kept hold of a uh, um, digital eight camcorder to make sure that I can, there's no guarantee that it would actually still work, but to make sure that ideally I can copy the um, footage off of old uh, small videos, camcorder videos, if I need to, and then copy them. I've got a uh, VCR set up here in this room with me that copies VHS videos and it copies them to DVDs, but I've also got the computer uh, connector so that I can wire my VCR up to a laptop via USB, which is really clever. And I can actually copy now straight from VHS to my computer via USB. Uh, so I've got so many old videos, um, including videos of me uh, from when I was like 19, 20, 21, something like that, doing hypnosis and all sorts of junk that I would do. Um, but what I used to do was record a lot of videos where whenever I would have people visit, I would set up a video camera and I would record just like an evening of us chatting. Literally, I'd just set it to long play and record like maybe four hours or whatever long play was um, of us sitting normally drinking Jack Daniels or um, uh, mixing spirits, probably not good, uh, or drinking absinthe. That was the other one we used to drink a lot of. And uh, so I would record us just essentially drinking, talking, messing around. And the whole time that I'd be interacting with people, I would always be doing something else. So for example, I would cross my arms on purpose at a point during the conversation to see how quickly it takes everyone else in the room to cross their arms and end up essentially uh, following my lead. And so I would uh, um, 
I would sort of practice doing different kind of skills. I've, I've often talked before that uh, being autistic and training to do things like hypnosis, I would obsess about things like practicing nonverbal behavior. So, but I would video all these sort of things. There's also videos in my early 20s with my best friend where I'm hypnotizing him. And so when I started uploading stuff online, I initially started, I felt back in the late, I think it was 1999, it was the first time I got the internet and I thought, oh my God, this is brilliant. Um, you can literally find all sorts of information that I couldn't find before. Uh, I loved that all of a sudden I could find all of these, uh, you know, stuff like freedom of information stuff uh, from governments and things. And that fascinated me that there was all these documents that you just could have easy access to. Um, but I ended up thinking if I can upload stuff, I can share my knowledge with people. And so I started making videos, uploading it to um, uh, MySpace at the time. That was what was around at the time that I could upload to. So I uploaded it to MySpace. I also was sharing things on Google Video. Uh, so this is prior to YouTube, prior to, you, prior to uh, Google and YouTube kind of being one. Uh, so I uploaded to Google Video, which was a separate site at the time. Um, and on Google Video, I could put long videos. So I used to upload things like, um, for example, there was when I was, I don't know, 2004. I'm trying to guess how old I was in 2004. 20, I don't know, 20 something. Um, so I uploaded long videos like uh, in 2004, I'd record, I'd uh, held a sort of self help type uh, phobia and post traumatic disorder, stress disorder treatment sort of two hour session where people would come along. It was free. So people would come along and I would then as a group treat them for their phobia or post-traumatic stress disorder, whatever they've got in that two hour session. And I obviously videoed me doing it so that I could then share the video so that then I could put the video online of me doing what I do. And that video could then hopefully help even more people who obviously I can't help face to face because they're not around. So I'd, I'd upload videos like that. I'd upload um, client session videos with sort of me demonstrating with people who've agreed to have the session that I've done with them shared. Um, so I'd uploaded uh, client session videos and demonstration videos to Google Video as well. And then I would put shorter videos on MySpace. Uh, so videos up to, I think MySpace was 20 minute videos, but MySpace is obviously a platform more for audio. Uh, hello. So, um, I would upload a lot of my audio tracks. I then was also with my best friend, we were doing, um, live, uh, webinars that wasn't really a term that was used back then uh, at least not to my knowledge people were obviously probably using it but it's not one i heard back then we were doing webinars and uh, myself and my best friend were doing something we called scientec uh, psychological enhancement technologies and uh, that was our kind of um, the name of our channel and we would then go live the two of us would meet up once a week sit side by side in front of a, a camera and film us live or take any questions in the live chat do demonstrations live on air all those sort of things um so kind of like an interactive live podcasty webinar -y kind of thing uh and then i was holding courses and uploading the footage from the courses and then in 2007 january 2007 i finally got on youtube um and so for 15 years, nearly, no, I've been on YouTube for nearly 15 years. Um, for 11 years, I was, no, where am I? No, it took me 11 years to get to 11,000 subscribers here on YouTube. 
in the early days, people didn't really subscribe to channels uh, that much. It was more about people watching channels and that was it. But also creators didn't really ask for subscriptions or anything. YouTube was just one of those places where you, you know, 2007, 8, 9, etc., where you watched um, videos, but you didn't really think of subscribing to the channel. You were just like, oh, I want to watch hypnosis videos or whatever, and so you would go and do that. Um, so my videos were very, 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 very popular, but I didn't really get many subscribers. Um, back then... Something else that was different compared to nowadays is, for those of you who perhaps remember this, YouTube used to have a messaging section. And so you could receive messages from people, so private messages from people on YouTube, a bit like Facebook or something with uh, Messenger. And so I would uh, get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages, which they all obviously disappeared. When, when YouTube stopped the feature, all the messages that you ever received had disappeared. But I'd get hundreds and hundreds of messages a month from people kind of asking me about the videos and wanting to talk to me about them and interact with me about them, um, as well as obviously all the comments you get on in the comments section of videos. Um, so, yeah, for years I was uploading hypnosis stuff. Uh, I'd uploaded like an entire hypnosis e-course onto YouTube. Um, or at least course of lectures uh, I'd uploaded, um, which I know some of you will remember. Um, I uploaded uh, lots of demonstrations, all sorts of different uh, bits and pieces. And YouTube, after I think about a year or so, allowed me to upload longer videos. So initially it was just 10 minute videos. So I'd have to try and break everything into 10 minutes, which was incredibly difficult as you can imagine, with self-hypnosis type stuff and things like bedtime stories. So I would do hypnotic storytelling as a kind of way of helping people. But say it was a 30-minute story, I'd have to break it into three 10-minute videos. I'd put the three videos into a playlist. Back then, there weren't ads on the videos, I'd put, and channels weren't monetized either. We didn't make money from it. So I'd put three 10-minute videos back to back in a playlist but then what would happen is people would complain because they'd say find us quit smoking video they'll listen to the first 10 minutes and they go oh this ended after 10 minutes i wanted it to carry on why didn't it carry on and in the description and in the end of the title it would say make sure you listen to the playlist so you hear all three parts back to back um because that's how that would work it would, in a playlist it would play all three parts um so i was really happy when youtube let me upload full length videos uh, obviously, now I upload videos sometimes eight to 14 hours long. Um, so that's a huge difference compared to 10 minute videos. And so I, I uploaded tons of videos, self hypnosis videos, uh, storytelling, kind of healing storytelling type videos, all sorts of things like that. Uh, those of you who've been around a long time will know a lot of the content that's been and gone. Uh, you made it. That's cool. Um, so, yeah, so I used to upload lots of different stuff, stuff about parenting, because my main area of expertise, despite the fact that online my main thing has been, oh, yeah, Dan's the hypnosis guy. He knows all about hypnosis. Off of um, here, off of the Internet, since the 1990s, my main focus has been around things like managing challenging behavior of children and teens, uh, teaching parenting courses, uh, teaching courses on managing child to parent violence and domestic abuse, um, teaching how to deal with difficult children of various sorts for different reasons. Um, so a lot of parenting stuff. And I've done like parenting research within my work uh, that I did because I wanted to. I wasn't asked to. Uh, I just decided I want to do research, and so I did. Um, so that's my main kind of area of expertise, and that was where I got into storytelling. So for those who haven't heard the story, so to speak, back in the early 2000s, I was working in children's homes, and 
the kids wouldn't necessarily settle at night. And so I decided that I would read The Hobbit or whatever book they give me. I think I've got The Hobbit next to me somewhere. I'd read The Hobbit, and which was the, the common ones at the time, because this was the early 2000s, the Lord of the Rings films had come out. So the common one at the time was that the kids all wanted Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit to be read to them at bedtime. So I'd read that to them, but I would read it in a Dan way. So I'd be kind of... You know, and then Bilbo went deeper into the cave or whatever it happens to be. And I'd emphasize certain words in it. I would talk in a soft kind of voice and I'd begin to guide them asleep. And I'd be talking along with their breathing. So all the sort of techniques that I teach and uh, that I use in my sleep stories, I would be doing that um, kind of in the children's home. I would be matching, so I would talk while the child is breathing out, and then I'd breathe in when the child breathes in, and then I'd talk again when the child breathes out, so that my reading would match, so the pattern of my reading would match the pattern of their breathing, so that then all I have to do is deepen and extend what I'm saying, and their breathing would deepen and extend and they would drift deeper relaxed and they drift off asleep and so I used to use all these techniques through storytelling to help kids fall asleep in children's homes and then the staff said how on earth do you get the kids to sleep incredibly quickly without lots of you've got to go to bed now look I'm sick and tired of this it's three in the morning please just go back to bed come on, you, you need to be in bed and all that kind of rubbish that goes on. Rather than arguing with the kids and increasing anxiety and trying to fight with them about bedtime when many of them had been abused and stuff and had horrible associations with uh, going to bed and being in bed and closing their eyes and going to sleep and really bad trust issues in relation to you're in a children's home with adults, a, a wide range of adults you don't really know, and you're expected to just who have keys to every door uh, and you're expected just to close your eyes and fall asleep like it's normal. Um, it's very hard sometimes to get kids to just naturally oh, go to bed now and fall asleep in that setting. So um, I would go into their room and I'd read to them and then I'd leave their room like 10 minutes later and the other staff so normally there'd be like a member of staff with each of the kids and a member of staff, if you've got enough staff on, who might be starting to write up paperwork. And I'd get back to the office and they'd be like, how have you finished so quick? The child you were reading to can't be asleep already. It's like, no, no, it's fine. Literally, I'm boring. I'm very good at sending people to sleep. It's fine. Um, and I would just sort of make a joke out of it. And then eventually the staff said, uh, could you not just teach us? Whatever it is you're doing is better than us being awake till 3 a.m. trying to get kids to sleep. So I started teaching the other staff how to do it. Uh, and then when I helped to set up a therapeutic children's home for young children, so that was with teenagers, I then helped set up a therapeutic children's home for young children um, for uh, kind of roughly five to 10 year olds. So they could come into the home between the age of five and seven but if they came in at the age of seven, the home was willing to keep them until the age of 10. Um, and so I then taught as part of me starting in that job and helping to set up the home. I then taught a bunch of the courses as well as writing a lot of their policies and procedures for the home. Um, I taught things like how to do restraint training, how to manage challenging behavior and how to tell stories to send kids to sleep, uh, how to kind of communicate in a way that knocks people out. Um, and so, yeah, so I, that's kind of how I started this whole storytelling thing. And I didn't really think much of it in relation to adults. So I used to listen to, and I still have them in reach, so I can probably show one on camera, just a random one. I've got a few knocking around here. So I listen to meditainment CDs. This case feels empty. I think it's in the bedroom. Oh no, it is in there. 
So this is Meditainment's Total Relaxation CD. Annoyingly in a big case, unnecessarily big case, because um, there's a normal sized case. So it's an unnecessarily big case. It doesn't fit into anything. They did learn their more recent ones are the proper kind of size. By recent, I'm talking like 2002 or something. Uh, that's from, I don't know, maybe 2000, something like that. Um, let me just put them back in there. They just randomly happen to be in reach. It's good to see me streaming live. So I have listened to the kind of thing I do since the 1990s, uh, initially on cassette tape. So up there on top of this bookcase behind me is a whole bunch of cassette tapes of uh, these sort of things. And then CDs when it got to the end of the 90s and all this stuff was coming out on CDs. Um, I know, to me, the 1990s, 1997 to me, I think is yesterday. Um, but yeah, so I've always listened to this kind of thing that I make now. And so when I ended up on YouTube, so initially, when I, as I say, when I was doing children's home stuff, it didn't even cross my mind that other people, and I think I've heard comments from people, not who I've seen in the live chat yet, but I've heard comments from people who are on my channel say they think that people would think they're crazy if they said, I listen to sleep stories. Um, but actually... That's kind of, I thought that I was the only one. I thought that I was the one that was a bit like, you know, oh, I listen to meditation at bedtime and I listen to sleep stories or whatever you want to call them at bedtime. You're lurking. I do that sometimes. Um, and so, yeah, so I, uh, when, it, I, I, when I started a YouTube channel, um, <laughs> I've got a lot of cassettes um, and some fun cassettes. I've got, recorded cassettes from um long before i was born i've got a cassette tape that uh mum recorded when she was a teenager uh she's playing house of the rising sun on guitar singing house of the rising sun and then in the background while she's singing my nan so her mum ends up calling down the corridor annie tea's ready and mum's like oh it's kind of like middle of singing a song and playing a song here, recording myself, and uh, you're calling down the corridor. But it's a nice moment to have on a cassette tape. Uh, I've recorded it digitally now, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I've got some fun cassette tapes like that. Um, and, yeah, I've got some – I have a cassette – I think I put it up there when I tied it up the other day – a cassette player here. Um <laughs> So, yeah, so I started uh, making a few, actually, cassette sleep stories for people. People were asking me. Uh, so I was doing therapy. Uh, so as well as working full time, I, as the 2000s progressed, uh, was working more and more as a hypnotherapist in private practice, um, sort of part time alongside my full time work. And while I was doing that, I would often do sessions with people, especially people with sleep problems. And I would think as part of this session, what I'm going to do is have a cassette recorder in the session with me. And what I would do is I do I books for me, sessions should be 90 minutes to two hours long. This whole 50 minute hour rubbish is rubbish. Uh, a therapist should, in my opinion, do a two hour session and it will probably wrap up after about 90 minutes. That matches with your ultradian rhythm. Um, and it's the best uh, with your basic rest and activity cycle. It's the best kind of length session, in my opinion. Um, and any therapist out there would know what ends up happening in a 50 minute session is that at minute 49, the client says, ah, I've remembered what I'm going to tell you now. And they end up coming out with stuff and it's like, sorry, but actually we've got to wrap up now because I literally have a client coming in in 10 minutes. And 
that's just the way things work. So if you do a 90 minute session, that moment happens nearly an hour into the session, if it's going to happen, and you've still got, say, 30 or 40 minutes of a session and a bit longer if you need it to address what has just come out right at the end of what would have been the session. Um, I have done meditation since being a young child. I didn't know that it was meditation. And then I started learning meditation and training in meditation. And obviously, I've always done meditation since then. So I, I sort of learned different types of meditation. Ultradian is a great word. Um, you've got circadian rhythms, ultradian rhythms, and infradian rhythms. Uh, circadian is 24 hour, ultradian is shorter than 24 hour, infradian is longer than 24 hour. Uh, and your basic rest and activity cycle is the one um, that is about 90 to 120 minutes. You go through that literally all day and all night. At night time, you dream every 90 to 120 minutes. During the day, you um, daydream roughly every 90 to 120 minutes. You drift into your mind. You stop paying so much external uh, attention. Um, but yeah, so what I would do is in a session, I would do the sessiony part and I would know that I'm going to then do something they can take home. So I would do the whole kind of, okay, just take a moment to close your eyes. We'll do a bit of hypnosis now kind of stuff. They would close their eyes. I would start doing a bit of hypnosis that I'm going to do specifically for the session. And then I'd press the record button on the, on the cassette tape recorder. And then I would say, okay, and with your eyes closed, even though that sentence doesn't mean anything to them necessarily in that moment, it also doesn't mismatch because they are sat there with their eyes closed. So I then say, okay, with your eyes closed, just take a moment to continue relaxing deeper to the sound of my voice. And then I would go on and do a story. And then I would, once I've done it, press the stop button and then give them cassette tape to take away with them. So in the session, they would have had the hypnosis bit and then the story straight after it in the, um, but then they would have that second bit to take away with them. Uh, that does sound very difficult. Um, so yeah, so then in the, uh, so they would then have that to take away with them. So I was doing this for sort of adults with sleep problems. Um, but I thought I was kind of one of the rare people who literally since the 90s has done this for myself, made my own tracks and used others' tracks. Um, yeah, so when it got to YouTube in 2007, I made a handful. I think one of my first tracks I made was the Adventures of a Prince track, the original version of that um which i made to be my most therapeutic track and i'm sure most of you have heard the story of that track that what i did was i thought okay i need to create a track that's about an hour long so just under an hour long and it's got to cover your predominant basic emotional needs um you get very used to you get used to your voice relatively quickly and it stops sounding weird to you um but yeah so I, I thought right i've got to create a track or i want to create a track that covers all the basic emotional needs so like your need to give and receive attention your need for a connection with others um your need to uh be aware of your mind body connection all these different bits and pieces it's got to also cover your essential innate skills like your ability to use your imagination and things like that um it's got to cover many of the kind of patterns that people fall into in relation to problems uh so it won't cover everything but the idea was to cover as much as i can in one track and then make sure that there's enough generic metaphors in the track as well that people can also then uh, and enough suggestions around the idea of finding meaning from the track that people can then find their own meaning within this track as well and then i created the adventures of a prince story uh and how i created it was i 
went into my bathroom, which was a, um, this is in a flat that uh, was like just, it was a studio flat that I lived in at the time. So it was a single room and a little kitcheny bit, but a single room and then a bathroom next to it. And the bathroom was no wider. It wasn't even as wide as the bookshelves behind me. And it had no windows or anything, just a door to essentially a cupboard. Um, and so I went in there, sat on the toilet in the pitch black, pressed record on a uh, um, cassette tape thing and talked. And that's how I recorded the first uh, Adventures of a Prince story. Uh, I literally just sort of thought, right, I've got to tell this story for about an hour, just under an hour. And that's literally all I did. Went in the bathroom, closed the door. I'm in pitch black, press record, and then talk for an hour. Anyone who's seen me create sleep stories live during the sleep story creation sessions will know that I'm more than capable. Obviously, this is e this is even when I was like in my early 20s, so it's going back a long way. But I'm more than capable of literally just creating a story. And so that's what I did. Um, I knew, right, it has to cover these issues. And I then just covered metaphors for all of those issues. So I did things like there's a wolf that appears following you. You get uncertain about the fact that you're aware something's following you, but you don't quite know what. And so I'm current, I'm covering the idea of um, how people worry and build something up in their mind that, uh, you know, that isn't necessarily based on fact. You haven't got the evidence yet to support the worry that you're creating. And it turns out the wolf is perfectly fine and friendly, etc. But because I'm addressing anxiety, I want the listener to experience just the very subtlest bit of anxiety, like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen next, before I then clarify, it turns out this wolf is safe kind of thing. Um, I do things like I talk about flicking a stone into a pool of water and all the ripples spread out and that technically that stone is uh slightly deeper that you know the, the, it's slightly higher up now than it was because there's a stone in it the bottom of it but you don't really notice you would only know that that stone has changed that pond or that lake if you were present at the time that stone changed that pond or lake so i i use these kind of different metaphors i use metaphors obviously of climbing mountains all the usual sort of stuff put it all in one story and when it got to 2007 I digitized it just copied it onto my computer and uh, uploaded it to YouTube and it's a terrible copy some of you might have heard the original with its hissing sound I then I think in 2011 or something uh, had deleted the original years earlier I deleted the original no actually I probably deleted it in 2011 but I uploaded a version with a backing track to try and hide the uh, um, the sort of hissing of how bad the audio was um, so yeah that was the kind of the first story that I shared here um, on YouTube and it, it was very popular the one track that was more popular than that one was the original version of my deep trance experience, which was an incredibly complex track that took a very long time to make, uh, not because of it being difficult in terms of what I'm doing, but because the process of actually making it was difficult or time consuming. So my original deep trance experience track which those of you who've heard it will probably say yes that's one of your favorites i suspect if you've been around long enough to have heard my original um had multiple layers to it it had um nursery rhymes so it has my voice down the middle and then it uh has had nursery rhymes so you'd wear headphones and then you'd hear say in your left ear Bar, bar, black sheep. And then in your right ear, maybe a little bit later, you'd hear A, B, C, D. And then a little bit later, you might hear twinkle, twinkle. And you'd hear these different things to build up your trance experience. Um, because 
every time you go inside your mind to complete a pattern, you enter a trance, essentially. You enter an automatic state. And if someone says A, B, C, D, you automatically, whether you want to or not, in your head, say E, F, G, because it's so familiar. So if there's a culture where it's not familiar, that technique doesn't work. But for a lot of people, it's something that they're familiar with. So if you hear bar, bar, black sheep, you instinctively want to continue on the nursery rhyme. So it's kind of a sneaky way of encouraging people to enter and deepen the trance that they're in, in a way that seems very friendly. And by using things that are familiar, childish nursery rhymes and phrases, you're also encouraging a more childlike state. And a more childlike state is more uh, kind of conducive to creativity and flexible thinking. You know, children have incredibly flexible thinking. Adults make their thinking very rigid. Um, so Erickson, Milton Erickson, would often start a lot of his sessions talking, uh, doing what, is kind of a uh, childhood type of induction where he would evoke the idea of being a child. He would say things like, you know, there's a time when you didn't even know how to tie your shoelaces, a time when you didn't know whether a D was a D or whether it was a back to front B, or perhaps it was an upside down P or a Q. And he would go through how you get mistaken when you're a child with whether a letter is correct or not. And, uh, you know, is a three and M on its side and all that sort of thing. Um, and the idea is that you're evoking that kind of childhood thinking so that the person responds, you, you've sort of primed them with that so that they respond better in that more childish kind of way. Ah, yes, I, I hadn't seen the Russian song comment. Yes, that's a very good way of uh, learning something. Hello, Diddle. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the Deep Trance Experience track was a... Um, uh, an incredibly popular track. When I removed it from YouTube, it had over 750,000 views at the point of me removing it from YouTube. And that's the video that is my biggest mistake removing it um, because of how successful it was at the time I removed it. Um, but it had lots of, you know, multi layers. Uh, it had sound effects throughout the whole thing. Uh, it had nursery rhymes, you know, me sort of going A, B, C, D, et cetera. But it also had me doing essentially like a double induction type thing. So I would be talking down the center, but then I would also give suggestions or ideas to the left ear or the right ear while I'm talking. And so I'd kind of sort of say, yeah, you can be listening to me, but uh, you can be listening to me, but you don't have to pay any attention. And while you listen and respond to everything I say here, you can continue to relax deeper and deeper. And as you relax deeper and deeper, and then I would say something here. Um, um, I don't know. I haven't, I don't think I've done one specifically for health anxiety. I've done lots for anxiety. Well, every single one of mine is for anxiety. Um, and as I say, the, uh, the, the biggest one for anxiety or the biggest one for everything is the adventures of a prince one i've done a couple of others since then there was one i did recently i can't remember which one it was where i thought this is like my updated version of the adventures of a prince um yeah the uh, bedtime stories for kids one uh, i've got another 11 stories to record and upload at some point um Thank you for the wishes. Um, so, yeah, so the main thing in relation to anxiety is that when you strip everything back, you, so my way of doing therapy and 
probably the general way of doing therapy for most therapists nowadays, um, especially if it's like coming at it from a more research based perspective is to look at the pattern and generally the pattern of the of a whole variety of problems is going to be it's a bit like with storytelling there can be an underlying pattern to multiple stories but the stories can sound incredibly different on the surface and that's kind of the way with us humans as well that someone might say i've got health anxiety or i've got anxiety around public speaking or i've got anxiety i'm always worrying what others think of me or i've got anxiety about this i've got anxiety about whatever it happens to be but ultimately when you strip it back to the underlying pattern they all end up pretty much fooling there's always exceptions but pretty much end up fooling with the same kind of pattern so it's more about does the person have in their mind what they want to be working on while listening to essentially the therapy as it were um and i talked about that in one of my interviews uh, that i did many many years ago uh, a therapist was interviewing me and he asked me a similar kind of question and i said that if i walk up to someone the sort of example i gave was if i walked up to someone in the street and did something kind of hypnotic as it were they're not going to respond necessarily to what i've said or done because the context doesn't warrant it so they don't interpret what i've done within a context that allows it to have the effect that i would quite like to have had but if exactly the same person is in a therapy session and i say the same kind of thing then they will likely respond in a kind of hypnotic way or in the way that i'm expecting so an example of this could be that if I walk into, I don't know, uh, my best friend, he used to work, uh, he's dead now, but I still call him my best friend. He used to work in a mobile phone shop. And I used to walk into that mobile phone shop and I would just be me, just normal old Dan. I'd walk in, I'd sort of say hello or whatever while he's working. I'd say hello to his colleagues while I'm going to see him. And they wouldn't think anything of it. I would kind of look at them and stuff. But as soon as they heard that I did hypnosis, I would walk in, and I would do exactly the same behaviors. But because they now know I do hypnosis, as soon as I look at them, they'll think, oh, no, I feel myself drifting off. I feel that you're influencing me. And literally, I'm doing nothing different. It's just that their sort of response to my exactly the same behaviors is different now just because the context has changed. Um, so in relation to therapy, if someone comes to therapy, I don't know, say for, they worry that everyone hates them or something, and they'd like to stop having that kind of fill their mind. If they come to therapy for that, but in therapy, they're thinking, oh, after this, I've got to remember to go shopping. I've got to remember to do this. I've got to remember to do that oh no did i park on uh did i get a parking ticket uh like a ticket to pay for the parking i can't remember maybe i didn't what if i didn't that means i'm sat here in this therapy session and i i may end up having a ticket on my car when i get back to my car oh no and they're not thinking at all about the therapy we're doing then it doesn't matter what i do it's unlikely to be successful because they're not engaged in the sort of the therapeutic process so i could say pretty much anything and they won't respond to it if on the other hand they are engaged and they're sort of focusing on um you know the the sort of problem that we're trying to work on then they will interpret everything as being to do with that problem and this is something that milton erickson said milton erickson said when he was asked, how do you seem to do therapy with people where you don't even mention the problem that they've come to be treated for? And his response was, I know why they're here and they're paying me as a psychiatrist to treat them. They know why they're here paying me as a psychiatrist to treat them. I don't need to tell them why they're here and we don't need to discuss why they're here. We already all know why they're here. I just need to make sure they're focused, that that's what's in their mind while they're here and that their focus is on the treatment for that and they will interpret everything i do 
as it must mean something in relation to this therapy or else this psychiatrist wouldn't be doing this. And he then goes on to tell the story of a uh, woman who came in and he totally failed to kind of achieve anything with her. And, you know, she wasn't responding hypnotically or anything. He would ask her to do something. She wouldn't do it. So in the end, after he asked her to close her eyes, he sat in silence. And that was it. And then he waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. And then about 30 minutes later, she just kind of opened her eyes. thinking, What's going on? And Erickson just said, I don't know what's going on. So I didn't hear you. I haven't heard you talk. That's right. You didn't hear me. You haven't heard me talk. So, you must have said something. That's right. I must have said something. But I don't remember hearing you say anything. That's right. You don't remember hearing me say anything. And that conversation just went on and on and on. And that was the therapy that he couldn't do anything or achieve anything. And she wasn't following any instruction. So the therapy was that she ended up interpreting well, something must have happened. You don't go to therapy for nothing to happen. And what happens in a therapy session must be to do with the therapy. But the therapy was actually him just mirroring back and sort of echoing back whatever she said to him as almost like statements. So I must have said something. Uh, I must have done something and that kind of thing. Um I speed up when I talk about unpleasant things and that makes your heart speed up. That's always a good sign if uh, you're in rapport enough to speed up or change based on me. Um, but the idea was that it made her have to focus inwardly and have to focus on trying to figure out what on earth went on. But also it meant that she left the session thinking, what on earth happened? I literally don't recall him doing anything. But no one sits for 30 minutes not saying anything. So he must have been talking. But if he was talking, why didn't I hear it? And if I didn't hear it, doesn't mean I was that deeply hypnotized. And so she's trying to obviously figure out what on earth went on. And she obviously then got better of her problem herself because she created her own treatment of what she believed must have had to happen. Um, I have done it with people. And so far, not a single person that I've done it with has expressed any kind of annoyance to it. Uh, curiosity and inner focus on trying to figure it out, thinking what on earth just went on. But they're normally so focused on trying to figure it out, they don't respond with annoyance at me doing it. Um, maybe I'm just lucky. But yeah, so talking about stories, um, so all of those experiences led me to starting to do stories here on um, on YouTube. And I didn't really think anything of it. The stories I posted were like, I have a channel to do with mental health. I'm teaching hypnosis and therapy to people. So what my channel's focus was, was let's teach people how to do the things that I wish I could do, uh, could learn uh, or or explore the topic of when I was a, a teenager. So when I was a teenager, I remember getting into hypnosis and then realizing that all the courses cost thousands of pounds and all the books, either a self hypnosis books, that one and that one are the first two that I ever bought as a teenager that came with a CD, uh, a cassette tape uh, in a box. Um, so I was aware that all the books that actually properly taught hypnosis were 40, 50, 60 pounds. They weren't cheap. Um, all of the courses that taught hypnosis were thousands of pounds. And I'm a teenager and I don't have that kind of money. And I don't even know if I like the subject hugely because I can't afford to find out. And so with the advent of YouTube, I thought, here's my way of being able to, you know, I'm I'm someone who teaches it. I am teaching courses, etc. I've written books on it. Maybe I can um, 
share my knowledge on YouTube for free. So I started sharing my knowledge for trainee hypnotherapists and, tra and trained hypnotherapists around hypnosis and therapy. And uh, I also uh, was doing self-hypnosis stuff and different self-help things. So there's a some of you might have seen it. I did a series of videos, for example, sat on Bogner Beach, where uh, so I used to do lots of sort of vloggy type of bits. And I'm sat on Bogner Beach talking about things like overcoming worry and how people perceive the world, and all different bits and pieces like that. Okay, no hypno stuff while you're driving. Pay full attention to the driving. Uh, it's okay. Um, so, yeah, so I was doing a lot of stuff for professionals, but also doing a lot of stuff thinking, right, let's, there are people who can't afford to go to therapy. And so let's also share a lot of stuff around that. So I was sharing stuff around, um, you know, self hypnosis tracks. Uh, around helping with multiple problems, um, making sleep stories, but sleep stories were a tiny little part of what I offered uh, on my channel. Um, and I never really thought much of it. They literally were just a tiny part of what I was doing. So for me, it was like the channel is the whole thing. There's all this stuff going on here. And um, so I managed to do that and through till ending on YouTube in about 2011 where for reasons I've spoken about before I came off YouTube for a while and I deleted like 600 odd videos and thought forget it why am I putting all this effort in uh, for abuse uh, from other therapists who are angry that I'm helping people for free uh, that literally was what they were attacking me for was that uh, I'm helping people for free and that shouldn't happen um, which seemed strange that it's therapists doing that. And uh, I then came back in 2015 thinking, right, let's get my channel up and running again. And one of the first things I thought, oh, what will probably help my channel a bit is if I just start by making a handful of self, I'll, I'll make like one self hypnosis thing every week, uh, sorry, every month. Um, and so I was initially posting five days a week here on YouTube in 2015 and 2016 and that's not sustainable um but it was right let's post a book review because i've got a few books let's post a book review let's post uh, a meditation or self-hypnosis thing let's post some kind of uh helpful kind of self-helpy type thing uh like a tips type video let's post something educational so i was kind of doing five different videos a week uh for different things and in 27, no, 2018, uh, I hit 11,000 subscribers. So 2017, I'd hit 10,000, which was good. That was my first kind of mark was all I want is to hit 10,000 subscribers because that's like a big milestone. You don't achieve anything. Like It's not like you get something for it. But in YouTube land, 10,000 is like um, YouTube classes you as now being a bronze level person um so you're nobody beneath ten thousand, and then when you hit ten thousand, youtube says that you're a bronze level creator uh you don't get anything for being a bronze level creator particularly but you are now a bronze level creator and it does open up not during 2020 because world events um and not during 2021 because world events but prior to that it opens up at being able to attend live events so once you hit ten thousand subscribers there are events that run specifically for people between 10,000 subscribers and 100,000 subscribers that I could now attend um, to help grow my channel uh, that are run by YouTube. And so it was allowing me to then do that. So I was doing that. Um, and then bizarrely, my three or four or whatever it was, uh, sleep stories I had on my channel plus the couple I think I'd uploaded in the beginning of 2018 started doing incredibly well. So I had like six or eight sleep stories on my channel and the rest of my videos, literally hundreds of videos were all to do with non sleep stuff. And yet nearly every subscriber I was getting 
was specifically because of those sleep stories. And initially I just thought, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm, these people love my other stuff as well. I'm sure they're not just subscribing for sleep stories. Why would someone just subscribe for sleep stories when they've got so much other content to access? So I naturally thought that the sleep stories were just like, oh, they're my little way of, you know, people like them, they subscribe. Um, hello back. You didn't miss much. I'm still rambling. Um, still catching up to date on my journey um, and how things had changed a bit. So, yeah, so I and Holly's on her way as well. Uh, she's not going to type in the comments, though, because she's driving, um, I hope. So, yeah, it's um, it took me 11 years to hit 10, uh, 11,000 subscribers. <laughs> and uh, then in 2018, so I actually wrote it down. Between January 2018 and September 2019, I gained another 29,000 subscribers. So 11 years for 11,000 subscribers, 20 months for another 29,000 subscribers. And those 20 months obviously were 29,000 subscribers subscribing for sleep stories. So it was starting to kind of make me think, uh, maybe people are going to want sleep stories not all this other stuff um but i didn't want to ditch the other stuff so obviously i've talked about this before but i didn't want to ditch all this other stuff i didn't want to ditch the um you know being able to share my knowledge i've literally got the knowledge of all these books plus more in my head and i like sharing knowledge with people um because it just feels like it just explodes out my mouth when people ask me questions about it um i have so over on udemy there is 15 hypnosis courses that i've got available or hip, 15 therapy courses because they're not all hypnosis but 15 therapy courses i've got available um i can't think of any ideas of i've thought of ideas for creating more courses e-courses but they're all things that because on Udemy, I've actually created about 40 courses in total, but most of them I've removed from Udemy due to them being so ridiculously unpopular because they're all things like how to treat different problems. Um, and the trouble is my popular courses on Udemy are how do I hypnotize people in one minute? That's the kind of thing people want to know. How can I do hypnosis fast? How can I do hypnosis covertly so no one will know I'm doing it? That's what people want to know. How do I write hypnosis scripts? they don't want to know how do i help someone who's depressed how do i help someone who's got an anxiety problem how do i help someone with ptsd how do i help someone with um i don't know whatever the problem happens to you know addictions or whatever people don't want to know that they want to know the uh kind of how do i do it and i always find it ironic that the amount of times I get the comments like, oh, I can hypnotize someone now, but I don't know what to do next. And it's like, yeah, literally, that is what I keep telling you, that you need to know what to do next, because what you do next is based on what you did before. And so if you don't learn all that stuff, you know, it's not like the hypnosis part is the magic bullet or something. Um, so... Uh, hypnotizing people covertly is something we all do all the time without realizing it covertly is obviously just without someone being aware that that's what's occurring my experience is that literally every therapist hypnotizes people covertly and obviously they don't know they do hypnosis and so they don't know they're doing it so they don't know they do it and the client doesn't know they do it and if you're a hypnotist you watch the therapist do therapy and you see how they hypnotize someone and they don't know they've done it and the client doesn't know they've done it. So it's covert to the therapist as well as the client in those situations. Um, the difference between covert and overt is the overt is, okay, I'd like you to close your eyes and we're going to now do the hypnosis. That's very obvious overt stuff. Covert would be, just take a moment to think about that. 
and the person's sort of, oh. and then you've done hypnosis um so yeah obviously there will be people that have manipulative thoughts in mind about what they can do there's a lot of complexity to do with how you can manipulate it's not hypnosis itself you can't just sort of say i don't know it's a very complex thing i've i kind of covered it in the dark side of hypnosis video that i made over on the mind changers where i go it's like an hour and a half video where it goes into more detail about the misuse of hypnosis but also in context with how to make it so it's misused rather than um and accidentally misused as well um if i just tried to misuse it like just face to face with someone the chances are it wouldn't be the right context yes i've frequently seen well we all do it literally with friends you fall into rapport with each other you end up influencing each other I had a work colleague who would always say, um, you wouldn't be able to do this, would you? And would say, you know, you wouldn't be able to go and put the kettle on, would you? You wouldn't be able to go and get this document written up, would you? You wouldn't be able to go using a hypnotic technique. And I knew they were doing it. And they completely didn't realize that the thing that was making them so effective at getting people to do things for them was the fact that one hypnotic technique is if you say the negative the other person wants to balance it out instinctively and thinks the positive. So they've already said the negative for you so that you don't have to. So by phrasing it as you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to do this, would you? Or you wouldn't be able to do this, would you? By saying you wouldn't be able to do this, the person said, well, yeah, of course I can, of course I can do that. Um, it would get people to do things for her without them realizing they've just been influenced to do things for her and she didn't do it at all consciously it was just part of her speech pattern her natural way of talking to people um and i think it came more from a place of anxiety of oh what if they don't want to do this kind of thing if that makes sense like she'd be thinking oh i don't know if i'm comfortable asking people to do things so she would say you know you wouldn't be able to do this wouldn't be able to do this would you as if to say I'm uncomfortable asking you to do this. Um, yeah, there's um, a story, uh, a one of these meditainment ones, I think it's their sleep one, where the woman on it says, don't give up, don't give up. And I just laugh at it in my head because she's constantly focusing on the give up part and your brain kind of to process things. You have to think about what it is. You kind of think you create representations in your mind. So you have to think about giving up to know what you're supposed to stop focusing on kind of thing. So in this case, to know what you're supposed to stop or supposed to not do uh, rather than just saying, um, keep going or something like that where you can create a clear representation of what keep going means in the context of the story uh instead she's telling you to give up over and over again but a lot of covert hypnosis is literally softening things so that people don't realize that you've asked them something like saying perhaps this could happen um you're using words that narrow it down um yeah the hypnotic assassin is fine as a sleep story for those who would go to sleep listening to i don't know a thriller or something um obviously it's not a traditional one it's a bit like my dragon's fire story that's not a sleep story that you would listen to if you're uncomfortable with um spiders being killed and people cutting their way out of snakes and all that sort of stuff. Um, but people who are comfortable with that and like that kind of story, then obviously it's fine. Um, but yeah, I'm determined to get up to date with what I'm sort of talking about my little journey up to where I'm at now. Um, so yeah, during 2019, obviously that was when 
most people who are in the chat uh, and who watched me, I think, probably joined me then. That was when I was attending things like Comic Con and the YouTube space to present about uh, Jediism and teaching different Jedi mind tricks. Um, and I was then at Summer in the City teaching uh, or talking about autism and being an autistic creator and you know sharing videos about autism. And it was at that event that I was talking to people uh, who know a lot more about YouTube than I do. So people from things like YouTube and uh, Instagram and Facebook and um, Twitter and these other places. And they were saying the way the algorithms work mean that, and obviously this still applies now, the way the algorithms work mean that if you create content, because I was saying I'm having all of these subscribers, but because none of them want to watch my, or very few of them want to watch my videos I'm creating, they're all for the sleep stories I'm not making. Um, yeah, I've no longer had COVID hair for a very long time. Uh, I got rid of my COVID hair April, I think. Um, yeah, so the way the algorithms work, uh, I was sort of saying, yeah, I'm creating all of this stuff on mental health and autism and hypnosis, and uh, but everyone just seems to be wanting my sleep stories. But I don't want to make sleep stories as a sole like thing of my channel because I've got so much more to offer than just sleep stories. And they were saying, well, the trouble is, if you carry on down the path you're going, you're saying that you're starting to lose views, even though you're gaining all these subscribers. Um, so gaining the subscribers, obviously, that's a good thing. Um, it's nice. But it's the views that contribute to income. So they were sort of saying, um, you know, if you carry on creating content that nobody likes, and nobody wants to watch, YouTube's algorithms will end up concluding that your own subscribers find something wrong with your videos. There's something obviously bad about them that means they shouldn't be getting views because your own subscribers aren't even choosing to view your videos. So YouTube will then almost blank the videos. They'll stop showing them in search results because um, they'll think there's got to be something seriously wrong with them if this person can't even get all these people who are subscribing to actually um cool um to actually uh oh yeah i remember talking about the harry potter thing or having it going on yeah um that was ages ago so yeah so they were saying if you carry on down the path you're going you're going to keep losing views to the point where all your videos will essentially get blacklisted by YouTube and they'll kind of stop showing them to anyone and you'll lose all your views. So then obviously you'll start also losing all your subscribers and you'll get no views. And that was the kind of realization that it was like, okay, so I've got a choice to make here. This is in 2019. I've got a choice to make here. Either I'm going to have to delete my sleep stories. I didn't have too many at the time. I had 40 that I created for my 40th birthday um, back in 2018. And I had probably about a dozen more than that that I created beforehand and a couple afterwards. Um, so I thought I'm either going to have to delete the 60 or so videos, 55, 60 videos off of YouTube so that then everyone knows and YouTube knows that everything on my channel is only about mental health, autism, um, you know, self-help, etc. Or I'm going to have to stop making what I've been trying to make on my channel since 2007 and focus on sleep stories alone and just do that. And then if it evolves where people sort of start saying, oh, yeah, could you just do this little bit or that little bit? Um, then I might do some extra bits, but generally it's probably not going to go in the path of all this mental health and autism stuff. And so I kind of didn't want to do it at first, but then decided in August 2017, at uh, 2018, 19, even that I would that's what I would do. And 
so September 10th, 2019, I launched my first sleep stories video, so to speak, my first official, this is now what this channel is about type of video. Uh, I launched the day before, so September 9th, I did a new uh, promo video thing saying this is on this channel, you'll find sleep stories. Um, but then literally on the 10th, I launched it as a sleep stories channel and spent um it was only obviously i got the slumberland name uh i finally had a chance to do all that just a few months ago um because i kind of went straight into it and took off really big quite quickly in terms of sleep stories um oh yeah it hasn't already been shared but yes that's the dark side of hypnosis um so yeah so that was the 10th of september 2019 i just dived into this as being uh right let's just do sleep stories and i dived in too hard as i do all the time uh, and was making i think three a week or something stupid thinking okay if i'm going to do this i've got to do it properly um so i started off making three a week nearly killing myself trying to make three sleep stories a week um i didn't have any cheat sheets or anything so to speak back then um that i was using i was just sort of doing it off the top of my head um you got stuck behind a tractor that sounds fun um not behind a tractor beam so so i then focused on just doing sleep stories i was struggling with constantly coming up with ideas and so i came up with a, a brainwave of an idea that i would seek the help of my viewers and so i started doing live sessions in i think november i'm sure someone will correct me if i'm wrong it's like october november i started doing live sessions here on youtube every week where um initially i was planning on right let's try and do some original stories that aren't done live i didn't know how it was going to go um but i started doing live sessions where i would say during the live chat okay suggest ideas for me that you want me to create a story out of and then you lot would suggest in the live chat random ideas like cat dog unicorn i don't know what else you'd suggested um but you'd suggest ideas and then i would create some kind of a story live on air and i didn't know at the time that when I go live, I lose subscribers. So I, I just, YouTube spends all its time on its training courses, which I've attended a lot of, telling you that going live is one of the best things you can do as a creator because people get to know you as a person. And, you know, they get to know you, they get to uh, interact with you. And because they get to know you, they become bigger fans and you actually gain more subscribers that's what youtube teaches my experience was i did my first live one and that one video started losing um something like five or six subscribers a day from that day onwards every single day the next week i did another live one and that started losing subscribers about five or six a day every single day and so i ended up posting a thing saying uh why is everyone unsubscribing what am i doing wrong uh, during my live streams and obviously i was then told you're incredibly boring um we don't want you to be doing these live streams we just want sleep stories just make the sleep stories and never go live um so i then tried facebook live i think it was holly had a bit of a negative experience when i did my facebook live one instead of youtube live um and so I tried uh, tried Facebook, thinking that way. I can't lose YouTube subscribers if I'm on Facebook. Um, and so I tried that and then just thought, because of Holly's experience, okay, I'll just come back to YouTube and I will lose subscribers so that everyone can be happy. Um, that's not quite how I thought about it. But, yeah, I thought, let's come back to YouTube and um, do YouTube again. 
but what I would do is do the live stream and then straight afterwards I would make it um, hidden from the channel so that anyone who wants to see it will have the link to it, hopefully, but I'll hide it from the uh, from the channel. So I did that and largely kept up doing the live streams for a reasonable period of time. And then obviously 2020 hit and uh, yeah, I liked Christmas. 2019 Christmas was cool. Uh, New Year, I like that as well. I like the New Year of 2019. And I also liked my 14-hour live stream that I did for uh, when was it? 19th of whenever my anniversary was for 14 years of being on this on uh, YouTube. I did a 14 hour live stream uh, where I was just literally there for 14 hours. And surprising to me, many of you actually hung around for virtually the whole of the 14 hours, if not all the 14 hours. I literally didn't expect people to hang around for 14 hours just to watch me doing a mix of playing computer games, having a bit of a chat. In fact, I don't think I did much playing computer games because we spent so much time talking. Um, and the 14 hours seemed to go by really quickly. Uh, and I don't think I ate. I'd had some food there to eat, but I don't think I ate much of it. Um, but yeah, so I did the 14-hour live stream to celebrate 14 years. And then 2020 World Events hit, and I did the 60 days straight of live streaming here, where it was like, okay, what can I... Yeah, Bam's doing 10 today, uh, a 10-hour live stream. So hello to him over on his channel. He won't see that, obviously, but hello to him. Um, yeah, and then I did the 61, 60 back to back, thinking, oh, this COVID thing, that'll be over with. Give it a few months, it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> I did 60 back to back, thinking there's going to be a lot of people trapped at home who can't socialize, probably lonely, maybe struggling with their mental health because of it. Um, let's stream every single day. So I read two of my three books here uh, during that live stream. I read my uh, autism books on air. I read my hypnotic assassin book on air. I I don't know what else I did on air. All sorts of things. Um, answered lots of questions. Somehow filled 60 days. Um, you're loving the live stream. That's always nice to hear. Uh, yes, if anyone is interested in things on mental health and autism and that kind of stuff, um, I do all of that now over on the Mind Changers YouTube channel. So I run a, a YouTube channel called The Mind Changers with uh, neuroscientist Dr. David Lewis, and the two of us post alternate weeks, although I plan on posting every week um, to try because I the channel doesn't get enough views and doesn't make any income really and uh it could do with growing so um yes there was a lot of show and tells so yeah so over there i do that i did have a channel called aspie reacts again no one was interested or you know not enough people to make it worth sticking at part of the trouble and i've spoken to abby about this a lot is that there's a lot that i do like youtube where i want to do it for fun so to speak so not fun in the woohoo this is fun sense but it's the best word i can think of um i want to do it for fun i want to post what i want when i want and not care about anything else i literally just want to think oh i've got this interesting fact or this interesting whatever i want to share that and i want to then just share it um and not chase an algorithm and that's kind of my biggest issue with youtube and the fact that because I'm doing this as a job, literally, um, when I was employed, YouTube, because I was making money being employed, YouTube and doing things like therapy or whatever, all of that stuff and teaching hypnosis and whatever was all able to be done as just a side thing. It was done more for like, oh, I fancy going and doing this. So myself and Graham would just think, do you fancy running a hypnosis course just getting a bunch of people together to have fun with hypnosis and we think yeah let's do that and so we'd then hire a venue and we just literally we're not doing it for the money we would 
often not even charge people. We would just say, come along for free. Just, you know, if we can get, a, we would get a venue for free normally. We'd like source one from a pub or something who's got a spare room. And we'd say, you know, we've got the venue for free. They've said, if everyone just buys a drink, they're happy. So if everyone buys a drink, we can use the venue for free. So everyone gets a drink. We have the venue and we would just run stuff. Um, and so everything was done in a non-stressful way. It was all done entirely about, oh, this would be a fun thing to do. The same on my YouTube channel. Anyone who's followed my YouTube channel long enough knows that a lot of stuff that I used to do was creative. I'm not saying my stories aren't creative, um, but what I mean is with creative in terms of literally I could just think, I'm going to do this weird, this, this video about something that I've just, you know, it may not have an audience for because I want to do it and I want to share that knowledge. Um, and then I'll just make a video or I want to make this, uh, you know, this, um, I came up with a book title similar to fun with hypnosis. Uh, but yeah, so I might sort of think oh, I want to do whatever it happens to be. And I would just go and do it. Um, but once your living is, you know, I make my money from teaching e-courses, writing books, and doing YouTube and YouTube and the e-courses are my two biggest chunks of income. And so, uh, and both of them are reliant on the organizations I use. So YouTube is obviously reliant on YouTube uh, and the e-courses are reliant on the company I use for my e-courses, Udemy. Um, so if they make changes like fundamental changes to things like pay structures or um to how they choose to promote things what they are going to choose to promote or whatever it happens to be i then can't do anything about it i just have to accept the changes and uh the impact that has on my income and the same here on youtube that if youtube's algorithms as it has done lately suddenly seem to sort of think well because an incredibly small per per percentage of your viewers watch your videos we don't think that people who like sleep stories like your videos. So we're not going to show your videos to people who aren't subscribed to you. And we're going to show them less to the people who are subscribed to you. Then all of a sudden the channel goes on a downward spiral rather than an upward trajectory that it's on when your own viewers are sort of, Oh my God, Dan's released another video this week. Let's watch it. Uh, and that's like, yeah, I follow, for example, Simon Dan. He's a um, kind of a person who posts videos sort of debunking flat earth myths, if they need debunking. Probably don't need debunking. It's probably the wrong word. Um, but he, he makes videos about flat earthers. Um, but I know, right, his videos, he does Tin Fall Tuesday, Flat Earth Friday, every Tuesday, Friday there's a new video on his channel and so every tuesday friday i look forward to seeing those two new videos and so every channel i follow that's kind of what it's like and so for me it's i always post every tuesday i've often posted on fridays as well but i always post every tuesday as the main weekly video and so the idea is um <laughs> uh so, well, as the things, uh, as the sort of meme says, you know, if the earth was flat, the cats would have pushed everything off the edge by now. Um, so, no, it's, well, it's better to, I don't mind where you listen. That's never really an issue. Um, it's, the issue isn't about any one individual. So even if, so I think I've got 25 subscribers on Patreon. If the 25 people started watching my videos just on YouTube, which I know a lot of you do anyway, when I do them as premieres, a lot of you will be here watching the premiere on YouTube where you can chat in the live chat while you're watching it for the first time. Even if when you're using the tracks, you go to Patreon to use them. Um, and from an income perspective, obviously, you watching it on Patreon and paying me £3 a month or whatever, you watching it on Patreon for £3 a month to watch all my videos, uh, to listen to all the audios of the videos, actually is financially better 
than the equivalent conversion rate per person on YouTube itself, where your one view might at best make me the tiniest fraction of a pence uh, per view. So the issue is when it comes to mass views. So if I've got, say, nearly 100,000 people subscribed, but only one and a half thousand of those, say, across the first month, choose to watch my videos, YouTube looks at that as, oh, so one and a half percent of his audience choose to, and it's not even one and a half percent because I might have, say, one and a half thousand or two thousand or three thousand views, but only maybe 40 percent or 30 percent of those will be subscribers watching the views, uh, watching the videos. So that's kind of the issue is in relation to YouTube is that there's a lot of um, the way YouTube sees it as not many of his audience like watching his videos. And it's not just about a handful of people. It's literally larger sort of numbers than that. Um, but if I wasn't, obviously, the idea with Patreon is if enough people subscribed on Patreon, uh, on Patreon as patrons, then I'm no longer tied to an algorithm. I'm then in a position where I'm making videos for you, so to speak. You know, I'm making videos for the patrons. I'm able to then say, YouTube isn't important. I post stuff there that helps people, people who have no money at all, for example. They can access it all for free. That's fine. But because I've got this handful of people that are supporting me, I don't have to think, I'm sorry, you as an individual say you'd like me to do another sleep story, but YouTube's algorithms say whatever you do, don't post another story. Um, and that's what had happened. So when I stopped a few weeks back, I stopped for like eight weeks or something, not posting an original sleep story. So I posted videos, obviously, regularly, but I stopped posting original sleep stories. I posted like the um, Norse mythology ones, things like that, but I didn't post any original stories because right on my screen in my YouTube dashboard, it would say, your viewers don't like the videos you're making, make something different. And it would then say, here are the channels that are successful that your viewers are choosing to watch. And it would very specifically say, here are the um, channels and the videos on those channels that your own subscribers are watching. So it makes it clear these are the videos my subscribers are watching that aren't on my channel. And so you look at that and you think, okay, so my subscribers are watching the French Whisperer talking about uh, various you know, mythology, etc. They're watching Relax for a while. They're watching um, Jason Stevenson. They're watching Michel Sanctuary. They're watching The Honest guys and it will tell me which videos on these channels are getting all the views from my subscribers and so obviously then the idea is that youtube are trying to be helpful and say your subscribers don't like what you're making but if you make things like this then your subscribers will like it because this is what your subscribers are currently choosing to watch instead of your videos so that's kind of the issue that you're always kind of thinking yeah but do I want to do that? All these videos, for example, every one of the videos pretty much has background music. And yet my own subscribers have often said, we don't want background music. Um, I know I make a lot of original content rather than reading everyone else's content, like reading novels and things. So I, I like reading novels um, for myself as much as anything else. It's quite nice when I've read a novel or a mythology book or something to everyone and it means that i've read it to me as well um so yeah it's uh you know it's nothing obviously i'm not saying anything bad about these channels i'm pointing out that these channels are where my audience is going according to youtube and that's fine there's enough room on youtube for all of us and there's enough enough people who struggle with sleep to listen to more than one thing during a night um so, yeah, so it's just one of those things where the idea of Patreon is it stops me being tied to the algorithm. It stops me having to make a decision like I can't keep posting original content because if I do, it's negative. Um, 
Nope, there's nothing specific that stands out uh, as non-sleep related. Um, but yeah, I like reading Poe. I think that my voice and my way of reading it resonates. Um, this, that sounded instantly big-headed. It's not meant to. My the, the re if this makes sense, the resonance within me while I'm reading some things, the same with Lewis Carroll, some things while I'm actually reading it have a resonance where I think I like reading this. Like I read Shakespeare, the uh, the sonnet, because to me, something about me reading the sonnet gives me a good feeling, if that makes sense. Uh, it, it makes me think there's a certain bounce to this. There's something about this that I like the feel of while reading. and the language as well i kind of find fits what i would rather be reading uh not necessarily the shakespeare for the language in terms of when you get especially to the plays it, but to the sonnets it's not too bad um so yeah so it's there's something about it like i'm not a lively active person in terms of like my voice or anything I'm not good at putting on lots of different voices or whatever. And I don't like doing that. I don't like having to put lots of energy into something like that because I find it incredibly draining as a person. And I'd rather not drain myself. So to read something where the idea is to be too lively wouldn't resonate with me. Whereas doing something more relaxed does resonate with me. Um, and some things don't resonate with me. For example, I really, really wanted to read Looking Backward 2000 to 1887. It fascinated me, the idea of a book, a novel, that, um, you know, that had descriptions of what the author thought the year 2000 would be like and how it came to that versus the late 1800s. But to read it was painful so it's not in my opinion the best written book by a long shot so to read it was really painful to do but I was fascinated by wanting to read for sort of the here's a description of the world in the future I was fascinated by the idea of reading that again if that makes sense I don't know if I'm making any sense but I was fascinated with the idea of reading about that it's just that it's an incredibly long book or it felt like it and once I started, I wanted to make sure I finished it, um, but it just didn't resonate with me and with me for reading. Um, I just carried on with it because I wanted to finish, because I started and I wanted to finish. And I did want to know how it was going to describe this future world, uh, sort of in all its elements. And I wanted to obviously know how it ended because I'd never read it. Um, so, yes, there are some books like that where I just don't feel it... Uh, it kind of resonates. Um, but yeah, I do like reading the sonnets. Um, so I think everyone's pretty much here now, or at least the people who were going to be running late. But yeah, the last thing uh, in relation to my journey to here is that I have gained 50,000 subscribers in the last two years. So since turning this channel into a Sleep Stories channel, I have gained 50,000 subscribers. So it took me 11 years to get 11,000 subscribers, 20 months to get 29,000 subscribers, and then 24 months to get another 50,000 subscribers. Um, now it's gone very slow again. So literally 50,000 subscribers. That is amazing. It is incredible. Um, and as you know, all through when I started doing sleep stuff back in September 2019, my channel suddenly spiked in terms of uh, you can see it on my um, analytics. It's kind of flat, 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 flat. And then a sharp up. Oh, OK, you're doing what we want now on your channel. We'll, we'll actually uh, we'll actually watch your videos now. Um, and right through till like, you know, uh, I think some of you were pointing it out to me as well, how quickly my subscriber rate was rising over 
the Christmas period in 2019, I was getting like 4,000 subscribers a month uh, through November, December, January. Then it tailed off a bit after the Christmas period uh, for like February, March, April, May. And then it increased again. And something like June, July, August, September, I was getting around uh, four to 6,000 subscribers a month. And then it started tailing off a bit. And then it was um, November, De no, December, January ish last year. Suddenly it started tanking, it started going right down. And suddenly YouTube were giving me all the messages saying, you know, your channel's not doing so well now. Uh, you're getting fewer subscribers. Um, and it started going down very very quickly within about three months it went from something like four thousand subscribers a month down to about 300 subscribers a month and that was the point where i thought i'm struggling to figure out how to fix this and then i decided right i'm going to have no choice i sort of tried for a few months and then thought i've got got no choice i'm going to have to stop posting these i'm going to have to follow youtube's advice essentially is what I thought. I thought I can't keep ignoring YouTube's advice. YouTube literally are the platform that I'm on and I expect them to be giving me the best advice. Um, so it got all the way down to like 300 subscribers a month and then I s stopped posting original stories and it started rising again. Um, and there was something about not posting a story for two months that meant that the story, the first story I did post did really well. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, so the I'm just trying to see how many people are watching. 25 and 28 thumbs up. It's very kind. Um, so the uh, I've still got half a coffee left. Um, something new that I've got available. Uh, I bet I can't find, oh, no, I can't get the link because I'm live and I can't access the page to get the link, but it is in the description. Something that I've got that's new that's available that arrived today, so this is the first viewing of it, is my Slumberland Dream Journal, for anyone who's interested. Um, it has... Trying to see uh, some information at the beginning about what is in it. So it's a 60 day journal. The idea is that you can then use it for 60 days if you use it 60 days straight. It's actually more than 60 days. 60 days sounds better. So it's actually, um, I think, 62 days. So the idea is that it will last two months. So the maximum you're going to have is July and August, which would be um, 62 days across July and August. So it's actually a 62 day journal. But the idea was to have it to last for two months and 60 day journal sounds better than here's a 62 day journal. That just sounds weird. Um, so it explains in it what's in it. So putting the date, um, all the different bits, loads of rambling by Dan. And then every page or two pages is essentially two pages of spaces that you can fill bits in and answer questions. Um, so you've got stuff to do before bed and then stuff to do in the morning. And the idea is that you then just fill in the before bed bit, missing it with my finger, before bed bit and then in the morning bit. And then the before bed bit is stuff like listing your worries from the day writing down what actions, if any, you could take to address those worries, writing down any feelings and thoughts about problems you're experiencing and how these problems impact on your personal or professional life. And there's three things you're grateful for and three things you're looking forward to tomorrow. So that page is largely to do with well-being. So um, to help with things like depression, so the actual scientific research around helping with things like depression and helping with um, anxiety and worry and all those sort of things 
there's a lot of things that you can do that are, that seem quite small but make a big difference um so when you do something called compassionate writing which is where you write down your thoughts and feelings about a problem that you're experiencing and how they impact on your life that has been seen to improve well-being and lift depression obviously not on its own but uh it can contribute to lifting depression um writing down giving gratitude so not some kind of new age thing but literally giving gratitude uh for things you've been pleased about that day even if i'm pleased that the sun didn't blow up today it doesn't matter it's focusing your mind on things you've been grateful for from the day and things you've got to look forward to tomorrow those two things combined have been seen to have a big impact on well-being and on reducing depression and anxiety and um, obviously helping people to focus more on positivity or positive things uh, not the same as positive thinking um, listing worries from the day and what you can do to address those worries even if it's small things um, like I can phone this person or uh, I can't do anything about that and so I can kind of work on letting it go whatever it happens to be um, that helps to improve sleep because it means you close the patterns from the day that have been causing you problems and by closing those patterns obviously you don't have to then dream them and close them instead you can close them before you go to sleep so that that saves you a bit of hassle at night and then in the morning um so i talk a bit about dreaming obviously in the introduction i talk about how to do things like encourage lucid dreaming if you want to do that um so for this section there's no need for you to necessarily write that down but i talk beforehand about uh here's tips for if you want a lucid dream or whatever and here's a bit about dreaming and when you dream all that sort of stuff and then in the morning you've got a section if you're wanting to focus on the dream stuff to describe your dream and what were the main feelings during the dream and if you are interested in trying to interpret the dream obviously that's why that's in there and uh, what did a reduced level of these fe when did the reduced level of these feelings occur yesterday because that will tell you what that dream was specifically about um, and what can you learn from it in case there's some like actually that's given me this insight or whatever um, and then a section on you know did you lucid dream and were you in control of your dream obviously I do give a warning in relation to lucid dreaming like I don't recommend lucid dreaming or trying lucid dreaming if you're someone who experiences high levels of anxiety um, and worry because uh, or anger because your dreams will have very heightened exaggerated versions of the daytime feelings so if you're someone for example that regularly gets annoyed with people then when it gets to um, dreaming at night time that being annoyed with people will be experienced as like a full-on rage with people because the emotions will be significantly enhanced during the dream. Um, being a bit anxious, like, for example, thinking, oh, I'm nervous to use the telephone or something, being a bit anxious during the day can end up leading to having fear during the dream. So I don't recommend people who experience a lot of anxiety or anxiousness or anything like that um i don't recommend trying <laughs> trying lucid dreaming because obviously uh you're likely to end up being lucid in essentially a nightmare in a very horrible dream um
obviously if someone you know people make their own decisions if someone wants to for example there are things i've done where i know that there's a very high chance of being unpleasant but you do it because you're interested and you're intrigued and you choose to do it um but yeah it's uh it's just obviously general well-being advice that in the same way that i wouldn't expect someone uh who experiences worry and anxiety or whatever to decide to listen to something like my hypnotic assassin novel or my dragon's fire story or uh me reading edgar Allan poe um before bed because obviously uh, that would be very unpleasant yeah you don't want to think about something unpleasant before going to sleep when you're someone who uh, already is prone to probably experience unpleasant dreams because you worry a lot during the day or have high anxiety during the day um yeah if someone's capable of lucid dreaming to the point where they can control their nightmares or their actions in the nightmare and essentially remain calm in it or handle it in some way or learn from it in some way um i just think people need to be kind of aware uh, hello rocky beach i just think people need to be aware that a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking oh lucid dreaming that sounds fun and not realizing that actually it could not it could also not be fun it's a bit like meditation people have this weird rosy image of meditation as being a calming pleasant thing but meditation for someone who or certain types of meditation for someone who for example has high levels of worry can be an incredibly traumatic thing and so obviously it's very dangerous if the person say it's someone guiding a meditation class um if the person holding the meditation class doesn't know how to handle that or what to say or how to help the person um So um, the gift that I uh, am sort of giving away for a you know two year anniversary thing is, and I hope people don't mind that this is all pink and girly looking. I like it, even if it's pink and girly um, or pastel colours. Um, yeah, the thing that I'm giving away is a obviously downloadable zip file with my most recent sleep stories album uh that people can then access uh the audio is of a lower quality than you get for example if you're in patreon which the audio in patreon is 320 kilobytes a second um may not mean anything to people the audio in the uh, zip file is 96 kilobytes a second the reason for that is because I'm very limited by how large the file could be that I could share. So I had to uh, um, kind of downgrade the audio. But because it's just me speaking, it's not as bad as you know, if I downgraded the audio of musical instruments and things. It's just speech. Um, but also in the album is a bonus track that nobody's heard yet uh, other than me um that was made with introverted fox's ideas that she suggested in patreon so the um it's about mig and her deep adventure And it may not be to other people's tastes, I suspect. Uh, you might like it, but it may not be to other people's tastes. Um, it involves a bit of deeper and deeper. 
a um, bit of diving, bit of swimming, bit of riding on a boat, seeing a weird whale kind of creature walk on land and go in the sea. Um, some foxes crop up in there as well somewhere. Um, caves, I can't remember. I don't know if there's caves or not. Um, there's a portal. There's some pyramids. Uh, I do have a load of, uh, I don't know how many, maybe four or five, maybe six uh, bedtime stories that include covering grief as well. Does it contain cats? That one I don't think has cats in it. I've made stories without portals. Some stories have doorways, like real, proper, full-on, a frame and a, and a door in it. Some stories have gates. Um, yeah, there's. I don't think there's any cats in it. Um, but there is a, a giant whale, walking whale creature. Um, and there is foxes. There's foxes in it. I remember there's foxes. There's trees. I've got trees in it and water, uh, a lake, a deep lake, an ocean as well, some pyramids, a comfy chair is in it, an annoying um, computer is in it. There's an annoying sort of AI computer thing. Yes, I like trees. I like nature. So if we go on land, there's probably trees. But yeah, there's an annoying AI in it. Spends all of its time just being confusing and irritating. So it's the kind of story that I don't know if it will resonate with others. Um, I think those who like it will probably really like it. Uh, others will think, oh my God, I'm turning this off. Um, yep the mirror portal one uh, so the mirror in the vintage clothing store that instantly teleports you to the time period of the clothes that you're predominantly wearing that store crops up in two stories, the dedicated story of its own, and then a person finds that store in one of my other story, more recent stories. The person finds the store and accesses, uses that mirror in the store. Nope, the AI is just an annoying AI. Any so something that deepens uh, things like hypnosis is having transitions, um, and that transition could be changing from one environment to another. It could be um, a transition like being awake and then being asleep and then drifting into a dream or drifting into a reverie or something. It could be um, a transition like walking through a gate or walking from a meadow into the woods it doesn't really matter what the transition is but every time you have a transition it kind of deepens the state and moves you to somewhere new and also it then works for sandwiching so what you end up having in a certain local or learning or experiencing in a certain part of the experience can kind of get stuck there so you'll often see when you um sort of see hypnotherapy courses and things they'll talk about they'll draw a line on a whiteboard or something and they'll say you know you've got your normal bit along here and then you reach a point where you say okay now this person enters the woods 
And so you then draw a line down here and then you draw a line along saying, here's what takes place in the woods. Yeah, you're sandwiching. Um, draw a line that takes place in the woods and whatever happens here is kind of contained. And then you come back here, join the line that's along here and carry it along. And people normally remember everything about that line. They remember walking to the woods. They remember that they were in the woods, but they don't really remember what happened. And they remember coming out of the woods, but they forget what went on in the woods because they've sandwiched it down there out the way. Um, and so I try to do a lot of that sort of stuff in relation to my stories. I try in relation from a therapeutic perspective. I try and sort of think, okay, this character does X. They, you know, they find a library or something. They go in the library, they find a book, they're reading a book while they're sat on the floor. As they read the book, they start drifting into a reverie and they start perhaps hearing the sounds from what's in the book rather than the sounds of being in the library. And so then it comes down here and you now build up that. You know, and as they hear it, they start looking around them and they notice they're no longer in the library. They're actually sat I don't know, on a pirate ship or whatever. And so you now then do a bit of therapy here while they're in the pirate ship. And then you perhaps have them in the pirate ship, maybe going to bed on the pirate ship. And as the boat's rocking over the waves, that rocks them to sleep. And they start imagining that that rocking feeling is the same as sitting in a horse and cart being rocked as a horse and cart goes across cobbles. So now they're down here in a third layer, kind of dreaming inside a dream almost about being in that horse and cart and you then do some metaphors and some therapy in that third layer and then you end up coming back to the boat and then you carry on that a little bit and then you come back to the library and you carry on that bit and then you maybe have them leave the library and go home and go to bed and you've added all of these different uh layers where you've been able to do a bit of therapy here about one thing a bit of therapy here about something else a bit of therapy here about something else and they don't notice um and don't kind of remember in detail all of these stages and they drift deeper and deeper and deeper with all of these stages. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, obviously that's just sort of doing therapy, but um, as I say, in relate for the question with grief, I can't remember the names of all the grief stories. One of them I think has it from years ago in the title. Um, can't remember which story it is though but a lot of more recent ones have been on grief because i had a bunch of streams where i was creating the stories where people were asking me um could i create something about grief and so i kept kind of creating stories on grief um and the one i've literally just done on patreon that i think went live today i haven't looked on my phone to see if anyone's seen it or not but there was a Patreon story I posted on my on Patreon today um, that will end up on YouTube at some point in the future. But uh, that one is to do with grief and processing grief and stuff. Um, it was made specifically for the person who asked for uh, that sort of you know, shared story ideas they wanted me to incorporate, but. Uh, Obviously, it's also something that others listening to it could be helped by. And when it comes on YouTube, like I often do, I probably won't say, oh, by the way, this also helps with grief. I normally don't say that. It's normally people only know it because um, they were in the live chat or whatever when it was created or they suggested the ideas and knew that the ideas were suggested for that reason. One of my reasons for not saying, uh, oh, this story helps with grief or whatever, specifically on like YouTube, is how many people would then never watch my stories. So I know years ago, so this is before I was a sleep story channel, I, all my stories I made, so like in 2016, 2017, they would all say, here's like, I don't know, the farmer or whatever it was, and this helps with whatever here's this story and this helps with this and here's this story and this helps with this 
and I used to get comments on them saying, oh, I really want to listen to a bedtime story, but I can't listen to this because I don't have that problem. And so even though in the description I'd say, if you don't have the problem that this can help with, you'll just listen to this like a normal bedtime story and you obviously just won't react uh, therapeutically to the, meta the therapeutic metaphors, etc., because you won't need them. So even though I say that in the description, people would not read the description. And so they would just see it as that's to do with grief. So I'm not even going to click on it to read it, uh, to listen to it. Um, so that's kind of why I stopped putting the additional, this could treat this and this could treat that and whatever, because it was just like, I, or else people don't even click on it to check it out because they think it's going to be something that they can't listen to. Um, The other one is if you just think to yourself, so this is something that because of the way I do what I do would work for anyone who was wanting to know, not that someone just off the street would think of this. Um, if you listen to one of my stories and thought, okay, I know this helps with more than what Dan says it helps with. I think it can probably help with my issue, whatever that random issue is. You're priming your brain to be open to the possibility of, okay, any therapeutic metaphors that link to whatever I'm wanting help with, um, you know, find them and help me kind of thing. You're, you're kind of priming your brain to focus on that. And that's something that, so when I used to teach a lot of courses, at the end of the courses, I would normally say, okay, just going to do like a therapeutic um sort of wind down bit now and I'll just do some hypnosis and I'll do some guided imagery as part of that hypnosis and tell a bit of a story and I would then say now I know that one of you has had something on your mind that you'd love to have had me help you with but obviously you are I sense you're a bit uncomfortable with coming up to me and asking me to help you and the opportunity just never arose but I've picked up on it and I know that you want help with with that issue um so this is specifically for you what i'm going to say now the rest of you will just hear it as a normal relaxing you know end of session meditation kind of self-hypnosis thing but you're going to hear it and pick up on all the therapeutic metaphors because everything that i'm saying is actually directed directly at you and then i would tell a generic kind of hypnosis experience and metaphors and stuff generic kind of metaphors like climbing mountains looking back at how far you've come you've struggled up the mountains you've got the struggling element in things that fit for most problems for most people um misjudging situations thinking that something is going to be one way and then discovering it's another way and that you prejudging it is was actually wrong etc all that kind of stuff and then what would happen is I would end up inundated with emails from people saying the way that you picked up that I had that problem that I obviously was too nervous to come and tell you about or to work in front of the group with about. And then we're able to direct that story at me and tailor it so well to my needs is incredible. It's been life changing. It's totally kind of it's helped so much. And I'd get all this praise and this thanks. The reality is I did nothing. All I did was primed people so that if there was someone listening who that resonated with them of like, yeah, I, I have been too nervous to say this, they would then pick up on it and treat it as it was for them. And they would translate all my therapeutic metaphors around what they needed. Um, so anyone who kind of goes into any of my stories with that kind of mindset of, uh, because the patterns are going to apply to a lot of things. So things like struggling and overcoming a challenge and looking back at how far you've come and being proud of that, any of my stories that have, for example, mountains in them, yeah, therapeutic horoscopes, I did think of doing that once for a laugh here on YouTube, or well, not a laugh, but, you know, something helpful, a laugh in terms of a laugh at real horoscopes, um, like a dig at real horoscopes, but sensible here on YouTube. I was going to do like, here's your daily horoscope here on YouTube um, 
where I would post like a three minute thing and I'd guide you through it. And it would actually be a therapeutic thing about helping people to focus on helpful things and to recognize things and things like, you know, uh, when that flash happens today, uh, you're just going to suddenly be filled with some insight that you didn't realize that you had about, and then I'd sort of be vague about something. And I would be relatively confident that a large number of people who listen will probably end up having a flash, like, you know, a car goes past and the sun catches the car window and it they suddenly notice that light. Or, um, you know, someone is opening a window in a building as you walk past and you see the flash of the light on the window of the building. If you're primed to look for it, you're likely to find it. Um, you know, someone turns on lights in a building and you interpret it as a flash of light had happened. So the idea was to do that like every day, just as like a three minute, I wake up, quickly record something, upload it to YouTube. Um, but then I thought, oh, God, no. That's, imagine how hard that would be to have to post something on YouTube every day when I was working full time. You know, I'd have to wake up every day, record it on my mobile phone as it was back in those days, and then try and upload it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, obviously stuff in my stories that because they're to do with things like struggling or having struggled and then finding a way through that struggle and then overcoming that struggle and then looking back at how far you've come and being pleased and proud of yourself, like all my mounting kind of examples, or finding a book that has just mirrors in it. I use that too often because I like it, but um, you know, finding a book with mirrors in and realizing that the answer's within you and uh, um, yeah, or finding a cave where all the walls are mirrored and all you can see on all the walls is yourself. And again, realizing that it's within you. Um, or, you know, kind of struggling through the woods and or through a forest or something and having to hack your way through, but eventually finding a clearing and getting out, you know, safely from the other side. And um, Or going down a uh, river or something that's really rough, but then it, you know, opens out into something that's calm and controlled and you've managed to ride out that rough water. Um, you know, all these sort of metaphors apply to a huge number of different um, situations. They're not just obviously anxiety and worry. Um, how much coffee do I have left? A little bit. I've got mince pies down beside me. I'm determined to have at least one mince pie. It's the first day that I've found mince pies available for sale uh, since they stopped being for sale in like February or March or something. I always look forward to Christmas season starting again. So I am determined to have at least one mince pie. So... Bear with me. I hope you don't mind me eating a mince pie. The mug is cool. Um, pretty much. So, contrary to popular belief among some people, uh, not scientists, but some people, uh, once you shut off from something and stop engaging in it, uh, it's no longer having an impact on you. So, for example, the way my sleep stories work, if you fall asleep, so you so you act, you're no longer actively engaged with the story, because you're no longer actively engaged with it. What's in a mince pie? Uh, loads of random bits and pieces. Uh, I'll show you the front of the box in a minute. Um, because you're actively engaged in um, the story that's what helps it to have that kind of connection and to work once you're fully asleep you disengage from it and so it stops having any impact on you um so these kind of subliminal tapes that say you know either say it sounds like there's nothing playing on it like no vocal stuff playing on it but actually it's below your conscious awareness if it's not able to be heard, it's not having any impact on you. Um, what might help 
is the placebo effect of believing that it's going to help you. Um, but nothing physically on the, a bit like the client I told you about earlier of um, Ericsson's where he didn't do anything, but he just kept acting like he must have done to the point where they then believed that he must have done. And then obviously their own inner healing, so to speak, kicks in and they find an answer. Um, so if you shut off from it, it stops working. And so my thinking when I make my sleep stories is, right, so if someone falls asleep quickly to this, they're not going to get the therapeutic benefit of this in terms of around worry, anxiety, stress, or whatever else it might cover. Uh, I've got ones covering grief, weight loss, uh, the immune system, all different bits and pieces. It's not going to help with any of that because you're asleep and you've shut off from it but you were listening to it help you sleep. So you've gained the benefit that you're after, which is to fall asleep. So I recommend to people who listen to it like that, who think actually I fall asleep really quick to it, but I do worry and I'd like help with worry. Listen to it during the day at a time when you're not likely to be tired and not likely to fall asleep so that you can then keep engaged with the story all the way to the end so that you can get the therapeutic benefit from the whole story. Um, if you, because if you fall asleep, you disconnect, it's not going to work. If you are aware of it and continue to be attached to it, you know, continue to follow along to it, then it will potentially have uh, some benefit or some therapeutic benefit of some kind. There's never a guarantee with anything, but it's it's going to have some influence on, on that sort of engagement. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I quite like mince pies. I don't know why. I'm not such a fan of Christmas pudding. But... Ignore the, ignore the, the bit down here. It's low on salt. I think that's probably salt. Yeah, it's low on salt, so it's healthy. Um. I'm about to have one, not six, not right now. Little Christmas trees. Um, so, yeah, so you don't want to... No, just trying to read that. The lucid dreaming file isn't influence it. You're not engaging with it as such. What the lucid dreaming one does is it plays a slight sound that because your ears, obviously, you stay hearing. So what the lucid dreaming one does is it plays a slight sound at roughly the kind of times when you should be dreaming so that you just become slightly more what you you're sort of a part of your brain thinks. I've just heard something. So you technically wake up ever so slightly. The idea is you have the volume at a level where it's not distracting. You wake up ever so slightly. And when you wake up slightly, you then essentially wake up into your dream. So you're dreaming, but you're now awake in the dream. Um, so it's not that it's something you have to connect to or engage with. What you can do is, for example, I could do a similar thing, so I, I obviously wouldn't do this, but say Abby was asleep next to me and she's in a deep sleep and maybe I've been nattering away for hours and hours. It's, I'm sure it isn't like me at bedtime to be talking to Abby while she falls asleep, thinking, oh, God, he's going on again. Um, but I could be talking to Abby and then technically I could say she was in a deep sleep I could raise my voice ever so slightly until I notice, or there are other techniques as well, but sticking to the lucid dream track type example, I could raise my voice ever so slightly so that Abby starts to come around and starts to kind of think, I'm sure I can hear something. So not consciously, but she just, I'm saying that consciously, but I mean, gives that slight reaction, that slight physiological shift in behavior that lets me know that 
she can hear my voice, that she's stuck, she's slightly more awake than she was. She's drifting out of sleep. I could do something like that. And now that I'm connected, I could then say things and see if I'm still leading Abby, see if she's following my lead. And so now she's connected to me. She's no longer in a deep sleep. She's technically woken up enough to hear me. And now if I'm giving suggestions or ideas and she's choosing to follow them, she's now engaged with me. So you can hypnotize someone out of sleep. So hypnotize someone who is asleep into being more into kind of being hypnotized rather than being asleep. And they may not notice by the morning, for example, that that's what happened. Uh, so in a number of my books, um, where it talks about ways of hypnotizing people, one thing that's been studied is hypnotizing someone who is asleep. So they're not asleep. When they're hypnotized, they're not asleep. They are technically awake, but they're kind of softly woken with the way you're doing things. Um, yeah, no good telling Abby to buy my books. <laughs> oh, no, you're saying buy me books rather than buy my books. I thought you were saying buy my books. I think uh, that sounds like a waste of money, Abby buying my books. But yeah, buy me books is a good one. Um, so yeah, so that would be the difference that it's not, uh, if it's just a sound, like if a car backfires, if you're fast asleep and a car backfires, you will wake up slightly. But as soon as your brain realizes it was just a car backfiring, you'll fall straight asleep again. The idea is, if you were dreaming at that exact moment, you'll probably fall asleep into the dream. Whereas if I said something to somebody while they're asleep and they woke up slightly, but they still kind of feel asleep and I, they're perhaps dreaming. Uh, so often the hypnosis research is normally when you see rapid eye movement and you know the person's dreaming, then you go and do this. Um, and you essentially have them go from dreaming to being hypnotized. Um, you got the hypnotic assassin. Cool. Thank you. I got one of them down next to me. Hypnotic assassin books. Yes, there's fruit in it. So given it's got fruit in, that means it's healthy as well. Low, low salt and fruit. Annoyingly crumbly. Yet yeah, real sounds can become part of your dream, as can other sensory stuff. Yes, there is high sugar and high fat. But we're focusing on the, it's vegan, it's low salt, and it's fruit. It's got to be one of my five a day. And if one isn't one of my five a day, maybe six count as one of my five a day. It's perfectly acceptable. Sometimes I will have it with um, uh, custard or something. Normally just cold, but have it cold with hot custard. Or cold custard if I'm lazy. The only thing I struggle with is how crumbly they are. I find custard fascinating. Like the fact that you can walk on custard. You can literally walk right across custard as long as you don't stop walking. Custard has magical properties. But if you stop walking, you just sink into the custard. It is.
custard is good. I did used to watch Brainiac. Um, not often because it was on, I think, Sky or something. It wasn't on real TV. If I had somewhere to put like loads of custard, I might walk on custard. The question is, do I really want to be eating the custard after my feet have been in it? Prefer crumble. I had apple crumble and custard the other day. Abby's mum and Abby made it. Yes, I've been told off for including lots of food in some of my stories. Talking of food, um, haven't heard from um, Mandy in a while on here. I did eat a tree. At Christmas, you eat logs, chocolate yule logs, trees, drink hot wine. Yes, here in the UK, you've got, obviously it's always changing a bit, but in the olden days, in the days when uh, the Brainiac program was on, you had essentially five TV channels, unless you had Sky or anything like that. I've got my um, Look Into My Eyes autobiography. That pretty much is everything about my life from birth to adulthood yeah mulled wine is generally better than non-mulled wine i agree with that obviously when i was young um so i'm not really that into tastes of things i just shove things in my face i'm not particularly worried about the taste of it Oh, no, I've got uh, crumbs on my dream journal. Now, can I pour the crumbs carefully off my journal? Um, poor little dream journal. This crummy face. Um, yeah, obviously, when I was young, uh, I used to pretty much just drink anything that was in front of me, normally by the pint. Um, there's an off license around the corner from me, which <clears throat> irritatingly spent years selling me cider, um, which obviously was cheap. Um, and then when I went in there to buy things like absinthe and Jack Daniels and Southern Comfort and vodka and things like that, they refused to serve me. Um, I did point out that they'd been serving me for years without any question and that if they thought that I was now underage years after they started serving me um I was in my 20s at this point I said if you think I'm underage now after years of serving me why have you been serving me for all these years uh, either you think I'm over the right age and you've been serving me because you think I'm the right age or you've always thought I'm underage and so you've been illegally serving me for years instead um, being like that with an off-license manager doesn't make them want to serve you any better, though. Um, it just made them want me to leave. But, yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, I, I didn't have any form of ID um, that was accepted, like passports and things, um, until kind of, I don't know, late 20s or whatever it was. And then I only got a passport to shoot Darren Brown in the head. Didn't get it for any other reason. Um, 
but then I didn't pass the auditions to do that. Well, just normal bog standard, you know, five or seven percent or whatever it is, cider. Um, I used to buy it in the five litre bottles so that I could take it home because uh, it was much, much cheaper, ridiculously cheap. Um, so I could take it home, put it in the saucepan um, and have a little set up with all other cider bottles and um, boil off the alcohol and uh, then condense the alcohol down bottle after bottle so that you then have a lot more alcohol uh, at the end of it. Um, and then I reached a point where I was earning enough money to actually buy something stronger. What they said to me that the reason was that there was a greater chance of me ending up making myself ill and ending up in hospital and the police then investigating if I'm buying spirits rather than um, if I'm buying cider because like a five litre bottle of cider is very unlikely to get you drunk. You're going to feel sick long before you feel drunk if you drink five litres of cider. Whereas if you drink a litre of Jack Daniels, there's a good chance you could feel ill from that. Yeah, I applied for the Shooting Stephen Fry one as well. And I got even further through the auditions for that one. Uh, I applied for... There's a video out there that Darren Brown has probably destroyed, but you never know, he may not have done. Um, and he had the only copy because I recorded it and sent it to him as the only copy that I sent him. I think it was the only copy. Um, I don't drink... Well, the last time I drunk spirits, I think, was probably 2019, 2018, something like that. Um, with my best friend uh, and he was the only one I ever drank with so now he's dead it means I don't really have any reason to drink so I might like have a glass of wine at a book launch or something but um, it never crosses my mind to choose to drink alcohol and it never has crossed my mind to choose to drink alcohol it's always been here's a drink for you or here's a drink or you know, is what drink are we having? And the expectation is you're going to be having alcohol. Um, especially when I was younger, the expectation from everyone was that you're supposed to drink alcohol when you're an adult. And so that's what I did. Um, my late teens into my early 20s, uh, I was frequently drinking. Well, no, actually, I stopped drinking on my nut when I was 19. Um, and then I started drinking at a much, much, much lower level um, when I was in my mid-twenties. So when I was 16, 17, uh, working at Butlin's holiday camp, I started drinking um, because that's what you're supposed to do. You go out and someone says, here is a drink and they hand you a drink and you sort of think, okay, thank you. And you just drink it. You don't pay attention to what it is. And then people say, Oh no, you're not supposed to. You know, you, you, someone says, what do you want to drink? I'll have a Coke, please. You're not supposed to have Coke. You're out drinking, have something proper. And so you end up for me, it was uh, someone ended up saying, this is what the in thing is now, which was a snake bite and black, uh, which is like half lager, half cider, I think. And a dash of black, uh black current and i would drink about 32 pints of that a night when i was like 16 17 18 years old um and then i moved on to because you do a lot of going to the toilet when you're drinking that amount um which is good because then you do a lot less com uh conversation um and a lot more avoiding people so i would normally um go up to the bar order two pints, drink one as I'm trying to walk back to the table because it would take so long to get to the bar and back from the bar at Butlins. Um, it was so busy. Um, drink a pint at the table. Oh, look, I finished. I best go again. And then I'd get up and go back again to the bar and 
go to the toilet and all of these trips would mean I'd get out of having conversations with people and get out of socializing um so it's a brilliant avoidance technique by constantly being able to drink uh and then I moved on to spirits and would drink about three bottles of Jack Daniels a night um at Butlins you were able to get hold of very cheap if you're a member of staff very cheap alcohol uh you could find ways of kind of freely getting hold of stuff um or getting hold of stuff at a very cheap rate and then there's a staff bar so I would normally go to the the public nightclub in Butlins that would shut at 11 p.m. and then at 11 p.m. the staff would go to the adult nightclub at Butlins so there's a family nightclub so to speak and then there's a an adult only nightclub you'd go there that would shut at 2 a.m. and then at 2 a.m. the staff bar is open till 4 a.m. so you'd then go to the staff bar until 4 a.m. and then my shift started at 6 a.m. So I would then go from the staff bar around the back of the venue to the fire door of the venue I worked in. I'd sit on the floor until 6 a.m. At 6 a.m. I'd be able to be let into the venue to work and then I'd work 6 a.m. till uh, 10 or 11 p.m. depending on which shift it was. And then I would do that six days a week. And then on the seventh day, I would obviously be at home and I would get like a good eight hour sleep or something. Um, so my holiday camp time working in Butlins that's kind of that was my life for years and then when I was 19 I ended up uh, with a girlfriend who I went and hugged her and said I love you and wrapped my arms around her and the next day she said when you hugged me you crushed me um, and it really really hurt and so that day I thought if I can hurt someone I love just because I'm drunk then I won't drink. And so I then just stopped drinking there and then. Um, so, and then I started again, like at a more normal rate, um, a non Butlins rate uh, years later, where I still I still often drank, well not often, but when I drank, I drank heavy um, because myself and Graham, he would just constantly be sort of, right, gonna top you up, gonna top you up. And then I would just drink it down like water um so yes back to the video and thank you daniel uh you jumped in the middle of a random story um so back in 2004 i think it was darren brown came on uh whatever it was named at the time um good morning britain or some such thing it, it wasn't called that at the time but it was called something like that um gmtv i don't know whatever it's called at the time Darren Brown came on there, did his, I'm looking in the camera, and then said, I'm looking for someone who is willing to uh, shoot me in the head on national TV live, and then gave requirements. You've got to have a passport because it can't be done in Britain. It's got to be done abroad. Um, and he said, you've got to make this video. And so he said, here are, he said, it's because you've got to be able to follow instructions perfectly, because if someone's going to be given a loaded gun, he was saying, I need to know that they follow instructions and aren't going to follow my instructions wrong and potentially hurt me because that would ruin the trick slightly. Um, and so I thought, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to get a pass. I'd never got a passport at that point. Uh, I thought, I'm happy to get a passport to shoot Darren Brown in the head. That sounds like a, a thing to do. So I got myself a passport, uh, applied for his show, made the video. And the video is things like um, uh, you've got to say some things about you, say what your name is, um, say some interests of yours, etc. And he said, you've got to do like a 10 second stupid dance. So there's a video out there somewhere, if Darren Brown hasn't destroyed it, of me doing a stupid dance because Darren Brown asked me to. Um, so I then obviously did all that on a VHS video, sent it off to him. Uh, I got, I've shown it before on my YouTube channel. I got a little red, I got a black envelope arrived in the post from Darren Brown. And in the black envelope was a single red, uh, like playing card sized um, piece of card with a kind of Darren Brown devil figure thing on it. 
Um, I don't think I have a picture of it here, but a little Darren Brown devil type picture on it uh, saying that I've been, and a little note saying that I've been shortlisted. Um, and uh, I can't remember how it's worded, but uh, so that was, I'm aware of how he does things. And so I was very aware that until I saw the program air on TV, I was constantly thinking every time I'm walking down a street, for all I know, there could be cameras following me. Every time I bump into a random stranger who suddenly asks something obscure, like for the time, it could be some stooge for Darren Brown. So it makes you ridiculously paranoid until you see the show air that somehow you could be chosen without knowing you're chosen. And you're constantly kind of thinking just because I haven't heard anything to say I'm not chosen doesn't mean that I'm not chosen. And even if I did hear that I'm not chosen, that doesn't mean I'm not chosen because I've seen his shows where he says, and we told them, I'm afraid you didn't get through. And then we followed them and we set up cameras in their house and we got their partner involved and we did this and we did that. And then we're going to do this to them and that to them. And so I'm very aware of that. Um, so obviously you're paranoid right to the minute you see the program air and you realise that it's not you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I didn't get through that one. I just got part way through the auditions, enough to get this postcard thing, uh, this playing card in the post. Um, then years later, I applied for the assassin um show the one where he gets someone to shoot Stephen Fry and for that one I got through the first round of auditions got through the second round of auditions that meant I had to go to a secret location in London and attend a um a secret kind of stage hypnosis show run by Darren Brown so there was probably 150 or 200 of us in a secret location with Darren Brown essentially acting as a stage hypnotist guiding us through um the uh a proper stage hypnosis show and as we were passing the different tests so at a stage hypnosis show the hypnotist is constantly trying to narrow down who's responding to what and how and so Darren Brown's doing the whole, um, you know, you put your hands out in front of you, clench your fists together, push your hands tighter and tighter together, keep pushing those hands tighter and tighter, lock those fingers tighter and tighter together, lock them so tight together that they won't separate and they won't open. And, and he's doing all that stuff. And then people who can't open their hands, he then says, you know, okay, you stay standing. And then he's got a team going around tapping people saying, you sit down, you sit down. So everyone who goes, nope, my head is like, okay, you sit down. Um, and then it gets to kind of, you know, you've got your eyes stuck shut and you can't open your eyes. You've got um, your hands are stuck to your legs and you can't get your hands off your legs. And, um, you know, you're stuck in your chair and you can't get out your chair. And so he's going through all of this. Um, and when it got to the you're stuck in your chair and you can't get out your chair and I'm sort of trying to get out my chair and I'm, I can't move and I can't get out my chair. In my head, I started thinking, oh, no. I'm not very emotional. I'm not very good at this. Oh, this is dramatic kind of rubbish. Um, if I pass the you're stuck to your chair thing, the next stage, I know how stage hypnosis shows go. The next stage is you now have to uh, come up the front and he's going to end up um, saying that he's making himself invisible. And then he's going to say, and when you open your eyes, you're just going to see floating eyeballs and he's going to do the whole, Oh, I've got my eyeballs floating thing. And everyone around me is going to be highly responsive and highly emotional and overreact and do the whole, uh, his eyeballs are floating. That's scary. And I'm going to be going, Oh, his eyeballs are floating. I'm really happy with this hallucination. This is a, a really interesting experience. I'm not going to be reacting like the others and he's going to want someone who reacts like the other. And so while I was thinking all that, I unstuck myself from the chair because I stopped paying attention to the reality that he was guiding me through and creating, which obviously is the way that you snap out of hypnosis, so to speak, is you just stop paying attention to the reality as being the reality. Um, 
So I stopped paying attention to the reality he was creating, meant I instantly then unstuck from the chair and meant I was then out. And obviously being out meant that I then got to just sit there and watch the rest of the stage show, so to speak, uh, while he narrowed it down to about 20 people. And then out of those 20, he narrowed it down to about 10 who were incredibly responsive. And obviously that his team were taking notes on the different people um, and who is best to potentially get on the show. Um, so I kind of went all the way through all of that. Um, and then I got a message uh, a week or two weeks later saying you're invited to a, um, a free Stephen Fry talk. Uh, Stephen Fry is giving a talk in London. You're invited for free to that Stephen Fry talk. Uh, this is a thank you for, for uh, taking part in the Darren Brown auditions. And um, so uh, obviously it said there's only spaces for I think a hundred people or something. So it said, um, you know, it's going to be first come first served. And I was at work at the time. And so I didn't get to see the email or respond to the email in time. So I never got to go to the audition to the Stephen Fry talk. But obviously when the show aired and I saw Stephen Fry doing his talk and then getting shot, I knew, ah, so that's what it was that I would have, if I responded straight away, I would have been able to, I had failed the auditions, so to speak, but I would have been able to go to the Stephen Fry talk and see that part of it play out. Um, but yeah, obviously that was another one where until it actually aired on TV, I was kind of constantly paranoid thinking I haven't heard back. I haven't heard anything. I'm relatively confident that because I haven't heard anything, I probably haven't got through, but I don't know for sure that I haven't got through. I could still have secret cameras everywhere. I could still be followed down the street. I could still, um, you know, have Abby in on it again <laughs> without me knowing. Um, Any time that it would be like on a day off or something. Oh, why don't we do this random thing today that I've never offered, never said to do before? I'd be paranoid, thinking, is this some weird like we're going to go somewhere and Darren Brown's going to suddenly be there kind of thing? Am I going to end up in a zombie apocalypse without realizing how I got there? um you know you never know so um yeah you you end up thinking that for like six months and then suddenly it airs and you think right that's definitely i recognize how this is the one that i was uh auditioning for um yeah luckily i haven't frozen myself on purpose just to screw with you because that would be mean um but yeah i thought you did very well on uh, the apocalypse thing i'd be much happier getting through on one of the Darren Brown shows than when I go to his live shows and being called up on stage. I always worry if I get called up on stage that I'll say or do something wrong. I like to think of myself more as talentless rather than talented. Yeah, I think it just happens sometimes because I've got an incredibly good internet connection and obviously a very, very uh, fast, relatively speaking, so fast for non-gigabit or whatever it's called, broadband, um, fast internet. So it's, I think it's fast. Uh, it's definitely fast enough that it should never slow down when 
I'm streaming YouTube and it should never slow down when I'm watching YouTube. And yet I do sometimes get the spinning ring and stuff. And then, um, yeah, not telling Ted, telling Dan. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't sort of, uh, I don't kind of, uh, even if you've got fast internet, I think it just randomly does its own thing sometimes. I've still got a bit of coffee. That's always a good surprise. Drinking coffee at midnight. But yeah, so for those who are interested in the album and the free, the additional track, yeah, cold is fine. I'm, I'm really not. I literally am very unfussy when it comes to things like that. Um, I am very unappreciative of things like food and drink. That's why I always tell people, don't take me to a nice restaurant or something. Don't sort of think, oh, it'd be nice to take Dan out somewhere really nice. Because it wouldn't. It would be a waste of your money. You'll be spending for some fancy food that I won't appreciate. Uh, just slap food in front of me. I'll eat it. Go to the cheapest place you can find. And as long as they do edible food, obviously. Um, as long as it's cement, if it's as long as it's actually edible and health, not going to kill me. Um, although even that's negotiable. Um, yeah, just slap food in front of me, slap drink in front of me, and I just eat or drink it and don't really pay much attention to it. I do like to joke around. I think that's one of the things that people find boring about me. Is that what sort of I don't know strange? Yeah, I find it a drag. I hate doing it. Uh, for example, apart from the mince pie I've eaten, all I've eaten today is I, I ate one, uh, ate a meal at lunchtime. Um, got water next to me as well, obviously. And I've got a couple more of the personalized tracks um, to edit that I've already recorded. And I've got more to record that I haven't recorded yet, obviously. And the one that went live today was the one uh, over on Patreon. Uh, I think it went live at like four o'clock or something, is the dog one. The dog finding the kitten under the tree. No, under the bush. That's the one. And then travelling into the land of the fairies via the uh, Pixies portal, as you do. Because the kitten's lost its mum. Or the mum's lost the kitten, rather. Right. Probably the kitten's lost the mum. However you think about it, they're separated. And they need connecting again. Oh, no, that's not the one I'm thinking of. The one that came out today, I was just reciting the wrong one. I was reciting the one from yesterday. Yeah, the kitten wanting food. The one from today was actually... The raven's fallen on its side. I'll have to straighten the raven up. Well, maybe it's meant to be that way. Um, the one from today is uh, Abby stuck a little sticker of a raven on my shelf, on a shelf over there. Um, the one from today actually was the one about the dog going to doggy heaven. That was the one. Yeah, the spotted dog that drifts off. Uh, and dies in its sleep in front of the fire and ends up uh, going through the seasons on its journey to heaven, so to speak. No, the raven is on its side literally 
a sticker of a raven up on my bookshelf. Uh, but yeah, but in that latest story, I have tried to make it vague enough that obviously those of you in Patreon would have seen the description, the the sort of suggestion given that I had to work with to make the story, um, and about it being about the person's dog passing away. Um, but I've sort of hopefully made it vague enough that even if people think, hmm, I have suspicions about what's happening here. Um, hopefully once it's on YouTube, people won't instantly think it's about a dead dog. I don't like that. Uh, they'll hopefully listen to it as a positive, nice sounding story because it is, I like it. I wanted to get it turned into, um, sort of processed and put online, uh, for, uh, patrons as quick as I could. And so that's what I did, because I quite liked it when I I did it. I quite liked how it flowed. In fact, the three that I've shared, I quite like. Mig's Deep Adventure, I like. That was a fun one to make. Uh, I had a lot of fun making that one. The Harry's Spiritual Journey. I... Uh, that was an emotional one to make and I quite like making that, but it was an emotional one to make. Yep. Over on Dr. David Lewis though. Um, I moved the prep cause he puts the premiere the same time. I haven't watched the video, so I don't know how long it is, but he puts the premiere at the same time for some reason on Saturday night, like midnight. Um, for his channel and the mind changers and obviously YouTube, if videos are posted across multiple channels that are the same video, especially at the same time, it treats it as spamming YouTube and ends up, uh, if a channel does it like more than once or twice can end up blocking the channels and not showing the videos on either channel to people. Um, so I just move the one for the mind changers to the right time and then leave it at that. Yeah, last time I fixed that straight after the stream ended. Obviously, I had to watch the three back to back and then I edited it down to 24 minutes afterwards. Um, but I had to wait for it to finish before I could edit it. Um, but yeah, and then the other dog one. It was Rene's one. Um, was I quite like making that one? I liked I liked the pixie portals. I just like saying pixie portals. Pixie portals. That was a fun thing to say. There are mushrooms in that one as well. I haven't had mushrooms in one for a while. I don't think. Yeah, so I hope Mandy's okay. I haven't seen or heard from her in quite a while. Thank you for popping by. Enjoy your dinner. I'm sure I will probably wrap up soonish as well. Um, I never end up showing the bits off that uh, Abby said, I'll oh, show them these things from the vintage thing. Um, because it wasn't very exciting. It was, I, I may as well get them anyway. Little bunnies. Uh, it was just a signed Jackie Chan thing. Because I don't have any signed Jackie Chan things, weirdly. 
and a signed Inside Little Britain book. So by David Walliams and uh, Ujima Flop. Matt Lucas. I like having random things. But yeah, they probably don't mean much to other people. Obviously, you all know who uh, Jackie Chan is. Everyone knows Jackie Chan. Can't just say Jackie Chan. So it's Jackie Chan. And obviously, in the description of the video uh, is a link to the Dream Journal, which in theory, I don't know, it may not straight away, because literally I um, uh, created the link today to make it easier for people. But literally, it should end up taking you to your local Amazon, where whichever country your local Amazon is in. Um, whichever site is the relevant one, but it may not do that straight away. Um, and it would be, well, I ended up deciding, I know it's a bit awkward having it like paperback like that and having to potentially write sometimes on that page. But I thought anyone who uses the more than one of these, um, like say you end up, it lasts two months. So say you end up, uh, I don't know, using it across a year. If it was spiral bound or something, then it's um, obviously it might not sit even if you decided to keep it. Whereas I was imagining that if it's not spiral bound, if it's just like this, you could potentially stack them, have them all on a shelf if you wanted to keep them all sort of filled in so that you could look back over them and see what you put if you're sad like me who would do something like that um so that was kind of my thinking there uh, another thing was that um there was an advantage i'm just wondering if i've got i do i will show you in a second um there was an advantage to being able to use amazon so amazon is much cheaper for me to use to print it than other sort of non-Amazon companies. So that means that I can make the cost of this a much, much cheaper cost. Um, yeah, it's, it would be that. If you ordered it, it, you would receive in the post one of these uh, real paperbacks. Um, but if it, uh, but using Amazon means that the per cost, the sort of cost per book, um, potentially you can order these once it's got into the the book sort of uh, publishing processing world um, will be available in like you know you could go to Borders for example and order it or uh, Waterstones or uh, whatever other bookshop. Um, Pens are too expensive to make, um, and I can't make it so that they, they're too expensive to sell as well. Yeah, Jackie Chan is awesome. I've got all of his, uh, I think I've got all of his films. I've definitely got everything that's possibly been available on VHS and DVD and Blu-ray. Um, it's a mix of... Uh, a bit on recording dreams and stuff around dreams and a bit on well-being and stuff to do before you go to bed. Um, and then there's a whole intro section at the front of it. Um, but yeah, let me just grab something else. Because I created, this is just for me, um, Slumberland notepads. So it literally is just a lined notepad. Nothing exciting. 
Um, but the trouble with these, I can't create them on Amazon. Um, and they are far too... Abby went to bed hours and hours and hours and hours ago. Um, they're far too um, expensive, in my opinion. I can't... There's no way I can make it cheap. Literally, the cheapest I can make that is £8.99. Which... To me, £8.99 is far too much for someone to spend on a notepad. I wouldn't expect anyone to spend £8.99 on a spiral-bound notepad of mine. Uh, so I will buy them myself so that I've got Slumberland notepads for me to use when I write in them. But uh, I definitely don't expect anyone else to spend that kind of money. Um, but that literally is the cheapest that it's possible for me to sell them for. Um, in a spiral bound format. So if I can find somewhere cheaper that does print on demand, spiral bound uh, products, then obviously I will end up, if I can get it down to about 4 99 or something, then I would end up selling it elsewhere. But um, I don't want lots of stock myself because I don't want the postage costs of having to try and ship uh, notepads from home or have to try and find a place for the stock to live. Um, so I'd only want it to be print on demand, um, and I can then just share a link to it, but the only places that do print on demand spiral bound stuff at the moment don't, are so expensive to make the book that I can't put it lower than 8 99 Um, whereas the dream journal, I'm able to put it as low as 5 99 I can't put it lower than that, but 5 99 so that's, and I thought that the good thing is the Dream Journal is far more practical anyway. Um, and there's other ideas I've got for similar kinds of products. Um, obviously, therapeutic things. Uh, the link is in the description of the video. Um, and Holly shared it. I think Holly shared it. Someone shared it earlier on here in the live chat. Um, but yeah, it's available on, in theory, it should end up available on... Uh, Oh, it's Fox. It should end up available in all of the Amazon websites and probably in about 60 days time once it's entered the book distribution kind of system, then it will start becoming available so that people could order it into whatever their local bookshop is potentially. Uh, And ideally, I was going to try and do this as a three-month journal because three months sounded better, like 90-day journal. But obviously, the cost increases with the uh, um, with the time, uh, with the page numbers. Yeah, Abby usually goes to bed a lot earlier than I do. She's very sensible. Um, and the other one was that I was thinking of possibly making maybe a slightly higher tier on Patreon where I would then post out um, a dream journal, maybe a dream journal and even one of these. Uh, every Probably wouldn't post it out every two months, but post out the equivalent of every two months uh, for that higher tier so that as part of the higher tier you would then just receive a dream journal uh, my thinking was just from a common sense perspective because i think a lot with common sense um my thinking was that i would then maybe send because these last two months three of these in the post to those people so that you've got it like for a six month period and then i only have to make one trip to a post office rather than a, a trip every single month or every two months or whatever um as a slightly higher tier but haven't confirmed that thought yet uh mainly because of the dan has to go to a post office and interact with post staff and has to package up books and um so it wouldn't be a much higher tier it'd be like i don't know maybe 10 pounds a month or something um but you would then get two free products or well, not free they're part of the 10 pound a month but you would then get um two products every 
like a couple of those and three of those for every six months or something. Uh, the t-shirts, well, none of my products ever make me anything. So when you look at, uh, I always find it interesting because I obviously watch a lot of YouTube's own videos about what they say create, makes creators income. Um, most creators make a very tiny amount of their income from ad revenue. The rest of the revenue comes from things like their merchandise. And my experience, even offering like, you know, pay $3.99 or $2.99 or whatever for, uh, depending on what it is, for downloading MP3s of sleep stories or whatever, even doing things like that, uh, which obviously the issues I've shared over on Facebook are why I've not added more sleep stories to um, Teespring. But the issues that I've had, it just, you know, the products I've done, just I don't make any income from it really. Um, Yeah, I will be heading off soon too. Uh, and thank you for joining me here. Um, but yeah, so I don't really, I probably sell like a t shirt or something or a product, regardless of what it is, a product, whether it's a, C, uh, a MP3, all the way through to, say, a t shirt. I probably sell maybe one every three months or something um, on average. And each sale, makes me about a dollar to two dollars depending on the product my mp3s make me a bit less for some of the cheaper mp3s um, but as a general rule my share of the income is about a dollar to two dollars per product that sells and i probably sell one a month or so or one every few months um, occasionally someone will come along and buy maybe 10 mp3s in one hit and i'll suddenly see a spike where it's like you've just made ten dollars uh because someone has just bought 10 mp3s at once um but as a general rule that's like a rarity and then the rest of the time it's someone just buys a small amount um what i saw the other day abby was recommended a um on on her youtube app she had a video sort of this video is recommended to you uh, and it was a um, a sleep story video of a channel that set up in march and the channel that set up in march has uh 25,000 subscribers that it's gained since march um and so i sort of said to abby can you watch the video so this video that's been recommended to you see what on earth they're doing that's meant that since march when they set up this channel um they've gained 25,000 subscribers. Um, that's very good going for a Sleep Stories channel. Uh, one thing that they do is they're doing sponsorships on their channel. So they had like, I can't remember what it was, a really completely unrelated sponsorship. It was like, I don't know, investment banking or something weird like that. But what the person does to be able to incorporate the sponsorships is they talk softly for the sponsorship so rather than doing the this video is sponsored by squarespace squarespace where you can buy the perfect website and create look at this wonderful website i've created with spare space squarespace have helped me to do rather than the lively kind of uh ad slot they start the video and normally you say this video is sponsored by squarespace obviously this video isn't sponsored by squarespace this video is sponsored by squarespace and um a little bit later I'll tell you about them. And then you do a chunk of video and then you do the Squarespace thing. And I've always said, I really can't do, I turned down things like uh, Skillshare when they contacted me and said, can we, can you do our Skillshare? Uh, can we sponsor your videos? I turned them down because I was like, well, no, I can't really do a bit. Like halfway through a sleep story, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. It's like, okay, now I'm wide awake and having a heart attack. Um, Thanks, Skillshare. So I keep turning these things down. But uh, what um, this company does to make it so they can do it in their sleep stories is they just have it at the very beginning of the video. 
but they say it in their sleep story voice and don't do what the company necessarily would have asked. So if you've seen like the uh, the headphones and stuff like, yeah, this company, this is sponsored by Raycon headphones. They are disrupting the every, every creator uses the same words that they've been given the same script and say, yeah, they've just, disru- they're disrupting the headphone industry or whatever. Um, yeah. Suddenly dreaming about Skillshare. Um, so yeah, but what this, channel does what the creator does is they'll kind of say, you know say um yeah, welcome to this sleep story and this sleep story is brought to you by skillshare and skillshare allow you to learn and then they just do the whole skillshare bit like that if the, it was skillshare and then they say thank you for listening and now as you drift asleep, and then they move into whatever the story is um and they do because i said to abby can you scroll through the comments and see if people are annoyed by this or not? Because I can guarantee that if I did that, started doing that on every video, people would end up saying, you know, I don't come here for the ads and they get really annoyed. Um, And I think out of hundreds, and I think Abby said there was like 600 comments or something on the video. And out of all the comments, there was only one or two of people um, complaining about the advertising. you know about the sort of that bit at the beginning uh most people were kind of accepting of it's part of the world we live in where the creator needs to make an income and if they're to keep creating and so if you want to listen to the stuff the creator somehow has to make a living to uh, enable them to be able to keep creating what you want to listen to Uh, and obviously i've spoken about this in relation to um yeah abby's always very supportive Uh, i've um spoken about this obviously in relation to my channel that if my channel continued to um go downhill by october or so i was going to have to quit my channel now so currently i'm just literally running on fumes just about managing to keep nudging my channel slightly forward and lasting a little bit longer um but i'm always kind of aware that I'm currently still right on that edge where my channel's not really like where it was last year or even the beginning of this year, um, where I might have to at any point just sort of say, no, this is the month that I have to quit it and stop doing YouTube full stop because I have to get a real job, so to speak, and uh, actually make a living doing that uh, sort of some other job and not this. And obviously, I wouldn't be able to do this to the extent that I do it. Well, I wouldn't do it at all if I had to get a job because I'd want my free time to be my free time and my work time to be my work time, not my work time to be my work time. And then my free time to suddenly be doing YouTube. Um, So obviously I've ended up setting up Patreon, hoping that if a percentage of people came over like one percent of people or something came over to patreon that would make up a chunk of my income um allowing me to be here if um i had sponsorships obviously or a way of doing sponsorships that again i know there was one creator i saw who was talking about what he makes and he gets sponsored I think it was fifteen thousand pound a year or something stupid um, on his hundred thousand subscriber channel to have him just mention, for example, Skillshare or whatever it was, um, on his video, and you know to do that little bit, that like one minute or two minute bit about the company. So um, you know, having that does you know most creators when you see them break down here is my breakdown of the income the lowest bit of income is obviously the ad revenue by youtube um the rest of the income is you know here's my x number of hundred patreon subscribers the income from that here's the income from um all of my sponsorships that i do every video uh or every say three videos or whatever it happens to be uh, that it's agreed with and that makes up 
nearly all of the income is all of those other th non YouTube parts. And that's what YouTube also obviously recommends. They actively recommend that you do those things. Um, and obviously a channel like mine where I don't put ads in the middle or at the end of my videos significantly reduces ad revenue even further, because if you put ads through a video, um, obviously you get paid a lot more money because people are seeing a lot more ads. Um, so yeah, so it's stuff that, yep. I keep saying that I'm going to go shortly as well. Um, so yeah, so it's stuff that I kind of have to think about, uh, but I had never actually seen someone doing like I do, um, but being able to do actual sponsorships as part of the uh, um, part of the kind of sleep video, uh, I'd always seen it as it's something that a sleep video wouldn't be able to do um, because of that sort of uh yeah the whole how do you put an ad like a sponsorship ad on it um but yeah hopefully fox you enjoy your story i look forward to hearing how you find it um whether you find it amusing or not when you listen to it but yeah so um it's something that I just have to sort of think about. Do I accept some of these sponsorships on the condition that I'm going to have to do it like that? Um, if I can control it and do it my way, not do it the structured way that they kind of demand. Because often, as I say, Raycon, every Raycon ad I see on every YouTuber's video that does Raycon is, you know, Raycon are disrupting the you know earbud industry and it's like you're just reading a script that you've been told this is what you must say uh, and you're doing it in exactly the same way and you're doing the here's a video of me wearing them kind of thing uh so all of these companies pretty much dictate how you have to do it i would only be able to do something one obviously if i agreed with the whatever it was uh, i do get random things asking me like would you be able to promote our mattress at the start of your videos? Would you be able to promote our sleep mask? That was a recent one. Could I promote someone's uh, a company's sleep mask before my uh, or during my videos to my subscribers? Um, would I promote? Uh, there's a company that wanted to sell me um, stupid pillow, like stupidly expensive pillows. Uh, not sell me, give me some two stupidly expensive pillows um, for me to try out and then to potentially have them as a sponsor that I would then talk about at the, uh, during a number of videos. Um, no, the sleep masks, I totally, I said, I contacted the company and said, they're overpriced, they're a terrible product, in my opinion, and there is much better out there for a very, very, very significant amount cheaper and I said, I will only partner with you if you uh, allow me to offer something free as part of the deal, because the price you're charging is too expensive. Um, so they were charging, it was a sleep mask that was essentially a headband. So it didn't cover your eyes. This this specific one, I think it was just a headband. Um rather than a sleep mask, but they, uh, I said there's actual proper eye mask ones that are much cheaper, but it was a Bluetooth one and they were wanting me to promote one that you can't put, it has built in, uh, tracks. I think it was six built in tracks. You can't replace those tracks. You can't listen to anything else. Instead, the Bluetooth won't work with anything else. And it was 129 99 dollars um and i said that's a ripoff i can buy a 25 or 30 dollar face mask that's bluetooth that can play whatever is on my walkman or mobile phone and that's a lot cheaper than something that can only play six tracks that can never be changed 
that if you ever get bored of those six tracks, there's nothing you can ever do about that. I said, you sell a version that's Bluetooth without the built-in tracks that can connect with your mobile phone, but that you sell it for like $149.99. I said, if you want, I'll promote that one if you let me throw in two albums uh, to the cost. And I said, I still think it's way overpriced, but I said, if you let me throw two albums into the cost for free that you can that I can then say, uh, and I said, if you put some of my branding on it as well, and then I can say to my subscribers, you can get this Slumberland edition of this headband that comes with 24 of my tracks that you receive when you, you know, in the confirmation of your order email, you receive downloadable, you know, two albums, 24 tracks. Uh, I said, I'm even happy to give even more tracks. Um, and obviously then you receive the headband that can connect with any device via that's Bluetooth. Um, and they just said, no, not going to do it. It's our deal or nothing. So, okay, well, it's nothing. Obviously, <laughs> I think you're overpriced. I think there's a lot better products out there. Um, no. So, um, yeah, so I just flatly refused and said that, that it's not going to happen. Hello. Was talking about you, making sure you're okay. Or checking, not making sure, checking you're okay. Thinking, haven't seen you for so long. Why are you not here? What else could you have on? Um, but yeah, very happy to see you here. So yeah, so it's... Um, I like my Bluetooth sleep mask. It was, I think Abby paid about £15 for it. The battery lasts a very long time and I can connect it with uh, my Walkman. And... Um, it's the kind of product that I would openly, and I have done, not sponsored, but just because I like it, I would openly say this is something people should buy. And uh, so if I was approached by something like that, I would promote that kind of product. Um, and I would happily partner with someone and say, can we do our own version where, you know, in the confirmation email, you give people some MP3s. and um, that way, maybe it will help. But uh, uh, Zoom calls. Really don't like Zoom calls. Dinner, 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 Batman. So, yeah, it's. Uh, it would be. I, I sort of might end up having to do sponsorships just as a way of being able to keep doing what I do on this channel, but I'm very aware that, and I'm more likely to do it now actually that I've seen someone else do it in a sleep story way. Um, but I'm very aware that I know that it would upset people and it would put some people off, but at the same time, as long as it's something that I agree with and I'm happy with. And I think, for example, actually Skillshare, I really like Skillshare. Um, it may not fit necessarily with my channel, so I may not do it because of that. But as a, a thing that's out there, Skillshare is something that I would possibly think of doing if my, I was on a different channel, like the Mind Changers or something. Um, in relation to Squarespace, which is another common one, I wouldn't do because I don't use Squarespace for my website and I've got no plans on using Squarespace. I'm not going to move my website to Squarespace just so I can be sponsored by them. So I wouldn't do Squarespace. Um, I wouldn't do Raycon because I think they are rubbish looking headphones. They're, they're totally the opposite of what I would ever recommend. I really don't like loose earbuds that you can sneeze and it leaves your ear and then you step step on it while you're trying to figure out where it landed or it breaks when it hits the ground or you lose one and you've no idea where it went and you're now stuck with one expensive headphone um so there's no way that i'm likely to sponsor raycon i like headphones that are on a wire so that they don't suddenly disappear out of my ears and land on the ground um so yes yeah, so it 
things like if there was a sleep mask or if there was uh, maybe a certain, um, I don't know, if there, if there was something that was relevant uh, that I liked, I might chuck it at the beginning. So anyway, as many of you are going now or trying to, I also shall go because it's 36 minutes past midnight now and that's probably a good time to go. Uh, I'm very grateful to anyone who, I'm just seeing how many people, 13 of you have lasted this long. Um, I'm very grateful to anyone who uh, um, has joined me here and to all of those who've subscribed, especially like the 50,000 of you who've subscribed in the last two years since I've actually been a proper fully fledged sleep story channel. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it might have been the spaces between the words, although my drone does send people to sleep too. Um, yeah, I'm very glad you popped up to say hello. So yeah, um, obviously there is a dream journal now available. I may do a higher thing of on Patreon. I will let people know. Uh, I've got Slumberland notepads, but I'm not having those for sale because I think they're too expensive. But if I do a higher tier on Patreon, I will probably give the Slumberland notepads like once a whatever period um, as part of that. Um, but other than that, I'm grateful for all of you being here. Remember, you've got access to the free downloadable album and the track that's in that album that's not been released anywhere yet uh if you want to go and download that it's obviously exclusive and like it's not going to stay available it's just available for now um because of yeah still here still leaving um very slowly leaving i'm like the person at the party that edges closer to the door and never quite makes it out um so yeah it's uh there's the free album there's the notepad. I'm grateful for all of you who've subscribed. Uh, it obviously does mean a lot. Uh, even more grateful for all of you who watch. So who choose to watch my videos. Uh, never mind how weird and random some of my stories can get. Although people do say, uh, like someone asked me the other day, do all of your stories start with a woman finding a book? And uh, it was someone who was complimenting generally, but... Uh, but it just randomly happened that the two stories they listened to back to back, they only got as far as the woman finding a book and then they were asleep. And so they wanted to know they've listened to two different stories and that's all they've had. Um, hopefully the MP3s, it should be straightforward to download the MP3s. I tried sharing kind of the page, the instruction page, um, for it over on Patreon, but it should be fairly straightforward um, to download it in the Patreon app on your mobile phone. There's a literally a download button, um, and then you can add it to a list as well, so that it's offline in a playlist, so you can listen to it on Patreon, or you can use the Google Podcast app thing. I, I've never used it, but apparently you can use that, or the I, Apple iTunes podcast app bit. And you can you can connect that and download it straight into that. And obviously you can do it on desktop as well. Um, but I imagine most people would be on a mobile phone. But anyway, for about the 90th-ish time, probably, uh, I'll say goodbye again. Uh, thank you all for joining me here. Um, the next time I'll be, well, I'll probably join in whatever the premiere is. I haven't watched David's video, so I will join in whatever the premiere is on Sunday at 8 p.m. on the Mind Changers channel. I don't know how long the video is. I don't know what it is. All I know is that it's premiering at 8 p.m., and so I will be there in the chat to watch it along. Uh, I don't know if it's just once or if it repeats accidentally. Um, that'll be something to discover. Uh, other than that, there will be another video here, obviously, on Tuesday. Yeah, I have no control over that. I don't know what's going to premiere and how until I watch it premiering. Because um, I, I don't want to watch it through 
to see if that's the case until I actually watch it because or else I've watched it and I quite like discovering it at the same time as you. So anyway, thank you all for joining me here. I will try and avoid getting into more conversation or else I'll be here all night long. Um, and I will see you uh, on Sunday if you if you join me. If not, then I will see you during the premiere probably of my thing on Tuesday. So thank you all for being here again and I will see you later.